All right, it is uh, 7.09 on June 30th, so I'm calling the Economic Development Commission to order. And present we have Laura Parker, um, Chloe Thompson, Denise Luciano, and myself, Sandy Allerhead. Um, I didn't miss anybody, did I? Okay. All right, so first on our agenda is uh, Queensbridge. Um, so the folks from Queensbridge, Bridge, looks like we have some here. Hello. How are you? Good, how are you doing tonight? Good, thanks. Yeah, it's, the floor is all yours if you wanted to go through and, are you gonna do a presentation again as you? Uh, absolutely. Okay. So, uh, Perfect. Queensbridge is gonna present like it's the first time we've ever met because it is uh, officially and formally Queensbridge. I'd like to present to the Ellie Norton TV. Perfect, excellent. Thank um, you. And I can give you, did you need to share your screen? Yes, please. Okay, let me just do that. Um, So you should have that ability right now. Okay, can you guys see the screen uh, good? Uh, not yet, no. Okay, just one second. Perfect, I can see it now. Oh, I think you're muted right now. Alexa, are you trying to talk? There we go. Perfect. Thank you. I'd like to start off by saying uh, thank you for having us this evening and hearing our proposal here in the town of Norton. Uh, my name is Tiffany Isom, CEO of Queensbridge Group Inc. I have here today with my with me my group. Uh, we'd like to do a general uh, overview of our business plan, our cultivation and marijuana product manufacturing overview, operational plans, security, construction, our timeline, our facility renderings, our ventilation, odor mitigation, route to market sales, as well as our community impact uh, here in Norian. So Queens Bridge general overview, uh, we are a disadvantaged business enterprise and corporation, majority owned, operated and powered by myself, Tiffany Isom. Uh, we are here today to propose our plan to not only bring our community based, based marijuana establishment to Norton, uh, but our plan to utilize the resources that our company will create uh, to bridge the gap, what we believe uh, could fix what is and what could be. Uh, our company is comprised of an all-inclusive team with specialized skills in zoning, planning, cannabis security, state and municipality regulatory specialists, as well as mentorships with established and proven cannabis establishments nationwide. Uh, we are a vertically integrated company looking to establish our entity here in Norton for cultivation, marijuana product manufacturing, as well as transport. Um, a little bit about our team. We are comprised of subject matter experts. We have legal counsel, uh, head cultivation, botany, security, marketing, branding, public relations, real estate, as well as construction uh, within our team. Uh, just a little bit about our ownership. It is myself and Kyle Sebeth. Um, our management, and I will get into uh, further down the presentation, we do get into our brand identity and story. So, you know, just bear with me, I'll breeze through to get through the uh, meat and potatoes for you all. But our management is myself, Chief Executive Officer, Kyle Sebeth, our Chief Finance Officer, and Shane Darcy, our Chief Operating Officer. We also have partnerships and advisories with Zach Pilcher from Cannon Construction and Timothy Arnold from Green Men Pros. So Cannon Construction has, uh, and he is here today, so he'll give you a little bit about his background, but they do have experience with uh, cultivation, uh, grows, and he's our general contractor uh, in-house as well. 
Timothy Arnold is a founder and head cultivator for Green Med Pros, which is a licensed medical commercial cannabis uh, marijuana establishment out of Rhode Island. Uh, our head cultivator has been growing under him for the past four years to gain the experience of the commercial um, aspect that we need as well. And he is will be working with us through our first couple of years of operation, um, as well as however you know we see fit that we need to grow our staff as well. So again, uh, myself, I am the CEO. Shane Darcy is my chief operating officer, as well as compliance. Uh, Kyle Seabeth is our chief operating officer, as well as partner uh, founder. David Caruso, he is our chief security as well as GC, uh, general manager, sorry. Uh, Johanny Viciana, she's our security director. And Zach Pilcher is going to be our uh, construction and design uh, manager. And our cultivator manufacturer is William Conley. And they all are present. And we will, um, you know, if given the opportunity to move forward, we will present everything that you need from resumes to quarries. We have submitted them, but we will submit supplemental or however you advise, you know, uh, we move forward, we'll proceed. So I'd like to start off with uh, just doing a little bit of address verification. We will be at zero South Washington Street, Norton Mass, this is our proposed location. What you see here to the left uh, is our zoning verifications, as well as just a general overview showing that we are within the zone where the location is on the map uh, as corresponds to the wetlands, which uh, our GC will get into a little bit further in the presentation. Um, and on the left, again, it just shows you where we're at on that lot, our proposed location. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about our finances. So Queensbridge, uh, as we stand, we've submitted a commitment letter as well as proof of funds for our first 1.5 million, which uh, will carry us through licensing and operational uh, standings. From there, we also have a commitment for full funding of 8.5 million is what we project for our build out of our 25,000 square foot uh, facility. Um, we have a commitment contingent on licensing approvals. However, I can submit the terms um, as well as the commitments from that investor as well, if necessary. Um, so right here, I'm going to introduce Jarrell Page, which is our chief botany from 662 Marketing. And he's going to talk a little bit about our cultivation overview and our manufacturing overview. Thank you. Good evening, boy. Good evening. Um, my name is Jarrell Page. I am the botanist um, out of 662 Group and Consulting. Sorry about that. I'm working with Queensbridge Cannabis on the 25 proposed 25,000 square foot facility. As you can see within the the slide show here that is actually showing you a little bit of the process of cultivation um, in which that um, we will we'll be growing within a 25,000 square foot facility. Within that 25,000 square foot facility, we will have about 16,000 square feet of growing space in which we will be intended used for cultivation only. Aside from that 16,000 square feet of cultivation, we will also have 4,000 square feet of space used for product manufacturing. From the, from, aside from those cultivation facility, um, cultivation spaces, we also have spaces within our facility to dry and hang, which is part of the finishing process of the cannabis um, that will be growing, I apologize. And that, like I said, in that space, we'll go through the six the six growth phases of cannabis will be basically from the sprouting of the seeds, the seedlings, the vegetative stage, the budding stage, the flowering stage, and the ripening stage. Um, the manufact, like I said, the manufacturing will be separate from the cultivation. As we see, we we're looking to to create byproduct within that manufacturing um, space, which will roughly be dependent on the market and increasing value. But as we see it right now. The, the market and value within cultivation seems to be about one fourth of what we look to produce. Within those 16,000 square feet of growing, um, growing space, we look to house about 1,280 lights. 
which will house about 16 plants per light, producing about 1.5 pounds per light, accumulating about five harvests per year. What that actually balances out to be is about 9,600 pounds annually. So within year one, that 9,600 pounds that we will produce will actually bring revenues in of $38,400,000 in wholesale flour only. I did also say and that's based upon a $4,000 um, average price of cannabis at the moment within the Massachusetts cannabis industry. Did, I did speak briefly about byproduct and we don't really speak too much about the exactness of byproduct, but we do assume that that byproduct will produce about one fourth of the total amount of revenue produced within the cannabis that we actually produce in flour. Our waste product is going to be licensed to also manufacture through our facility, which we will produce our trimmed waste material from each of our harvests. We will also acquire waste product from other licenses facilities as well as within the Massachusetts, within Massachusetts that have the ability to cultivate marijuana, but cannot process their waste products themselves. Um, within those, also that byproduct that I also speak about, we will also be producing edibles, tinctures, rubs, skin products, drinks, and anything else in the market can produce. This brings me to the point where CreamBiz has established a forward working relationship with Endo Laboratories, which is one of the testing facilities in Massachusetts, but to not only establish, but lead in the most efficient, safe, and scientific way. Now that you have a general understanding of where we will take place, I will explain to you a little bit more about the um, product financial projections. Do you have any questions? I got a, a question regarding the uh, the waste product and the processing. What is that? What does that entail? What's that look like? So further on down the the um presentation we're going to explain a little bit more about the waste product and the process within that waste product so we'll give you a little bit more about that in a in a couple of more slides anyone else have any questions from the board um i guess the assumption there 9600 pounds per year um and the 38.4 million that would be assuming market stability around that $4,000 per pound. That's just purely for the flour and doesn't take into account the use of any of that for other products for the manufacturing, right? It's a, not 100%. You said, is it going to be a, about a quarter will be the flour and then the rest of it, the other 75% or so are going to, is going to go towards the manufacturing? No, no, no. How it goes is that the flour produces about the 38 Point four million dollars within itself. The byproduct that's left after we cut the actual plant down, which consists of the the trim, which is the left leaves, the stalks, and any other of the other process, the products that's left over. When we manufacture the rest of those products, it actually turns into about one fourth of usable byproduct to create the tinctures and the other things. So that's about an estimated $9.6 million in additional revenues, but that is based upon the lower end of the market at the particular moment. Gotcha, okay. Hold on one second. Any other questions? The next slide. Oh, hold on one second. Thank you. So Jarrell's overview was to show us uh, we will be growing in a, a double tiered system. Um, so within that, there is a, a metric system of how you calculate it, and it's pretty concrete. So to answer your question about the current market, so right now you have 101 retailers, 14 operating, uh, possibly 17 today operating cultivation sites. So our Massachusetts market is much like any other. Um, the reason why you'll, you'll see such a splurge and a lot of folks, you know, trying to get into our Massachusetts market is because it's compared to everywhere else, it's upside down, it's backwards. So Rhode Island, just over the state line, saturated the opposite way around. You know, we don't know, um, as you can see, right, there's no cap on a cultivation license. So today, yes, it's a viable market, it's 4000 a pound, you know, this is what we have, and it's only going to go up within the next three years. 
you know, cultivation um, is the toughest uh, project to put together under the licensures, just because of the magnitude of the uh, group that you need to get together because of, um, you know, the, the process through the municipalities, through after you go through HSA, through zoning planning, and it's just uh, so unknown. So when it comes to, you know, just really um, trying to force you or predict the market, if we can, there are a lot of BSAs, there are financials. Um, I do have actually if you want to speak a little bit further down the line, we can give you some of what those market analysis look like and, and, and how we first do that over the next couple of years. But, and 4,000, uh, if I'm being frank, is a low number. So um, as of right now, we have made contact with all 101 retailers and every single one of them are uh, pretty much with a cultivator. Um, and again, that's as it stands now. So what Queensbridge has done is created a sales team within that is thinking a little bit forward as well. So we've made those connections and contacts projecting for the market to change. Um, and then uh, as I've spoken in the past, what our by byproduct allows us to do is to account for any losses that our business would have. So in conventional business, you know, you have 20%, 30%. Well, with byproduct, it's different. It doesn't have to pass that test. And with us partnering uh, and working side by side with a laboratory, which are your governing police of the cannabis space, there are three licensed laboratories in the state. Um, and we work very closely with Indo Labs where they are going to help guide our SOPs and policies from the beginning so that you know, we do have minimal amounts of uh, rejection or so to speak, a loss. But with that being said, we might not be able to sell it as a flower, but you can turn it into a tincture. Uh, Forbes projects by 2025, uh, THC <laughs> products, you're talking 17.5 billion in the market, right? So Massachusetts, our legislation is written the most loosely in all of the states that it's legal thus far. So we are in um, you know, that opportunity space where we can just tell you what it looks like today. But again, in cannabis, it's dog years. So we know that we have this three year window and then everything's gonna change. So we're, we're trying to be progressive and stay ahead of that. And um, you know, it's just a little bit about our financial piece. That I <clears throat> Hope it helps you guys. Um, I'm gonna move into construction. I'm gonna bring in Zach uh, Pilcher, thanks. Good evening, members of the board. My name is Zachary Pilcher. Uh, I'm the design and construction lead, as well as the general contract for the project. My background is in large scale uh, commercial construction. Uh, during my career, I've managed uh, major construction projects, including high rise construction, uh, manufacturing facilities, uh, academic construction for many uh, colleges and universities in New England, uh, as well as in the last three years, uh, cannabis cultivation construction. Uh, so we're proposing a 25,000 square foot steel facility. Uh, it's very similar to what's shown or uh, being shown in this video. Um, the structure will be utilized for cultivation, manufacturing, as well as transport of cannabis. Uh, of the 25,000 square feet, uh, 4,000 square feet, uh, dedicated to manufacturing. As part of our uh, due diligence, we would work closely with the Norton Fire Department, uh, Conservation Department, uh, Mass DEP, uh, Norton Water Department, uh, building departments throughout all phases of the development. Um, one of our primary priorities here is uh, that we meet and exceed the requirements of each town authority. Um, so Queensbridge is dedicated also to hiring a Norton detail officer uh, as needed during construction, and we will need that during construction at, at various points. Uh, and Queensbridge is also committed to recruiting local Norton vendors and subcontractors during the construction phase, uh, as we do in different towns that we that we do cannabis cultivations in. Uh, and please note that uh, if approved, all plans would be designed by a wetland scientist, Massachusetts licensed uh, engineer and architect. So uh, we've prepared a timeline uh, I think we've reviewed it uh, at, at previous meetings. Um, what that timeline shows is, and I think you may only be looking at the second page of that timeline here, but I can kind of run you through uh, the entirety of it. So what that, what that schedule shows is that we obtain our HCA uh, in July. And I, I realize that may be 
a little bit uh, of an unknown at this point, you know, per, per this process, we're not exactly sure when an HCA happens, but for the purpose of our schedule, we're assuming that we have one in July. Uh, we have, based on WBE, MBE status, we have an expedited 60 day uh, duration to our provisional license with the CCC, uh, which gets us um, to a provisional license by the beginning of October. Um, while that's happening, while we're getting our license, we're engaging our civil engineering group and wetland scientists to do our due diligence on site uh, so that we can get a leg up on that because the DEP takes a long time to uh, to review these plans and it, it generally takes uh, about four to six months to get through that process. So this gets us to a point of, uh, of being construction ready, uh, shovel ready, I should say, by, uh, by February of 2022 and uh, complete with construction by the beginning of the first quarter of 2023. Uh, so we've, we've identified, uh, you know, kind of the steps along the way that we've experienced it, it in different, you know, on different projects in different towns in Massachusetts, as well as what our really hot button lead, lead time items are, you know, the items that we have to procure uh, to make the project happen that take, you know, any amount of time. Um, so we've, we've got our baseline schedule kind of, kind of based on what we know um, at, at this point. And before we go to the next slide, do you have any questions based on the schedule? I've got a question. It's, it's um, probably one of the, the biggest concerns uh, that people have with cultivation is uh, odor control, odor mitigation. Is that, is that gonna fall under you know, questions to ask you, or is that something that comes up later on? It is. We have a few slides later in the presentation that I'll, that I'll go over that speak to that. Um, so if you'd let me run through my spiel on, on that, you, you may just be satisfied with it. Um, so we, we show some preliminary renderings that we've done uh, to give you an idea of what the building would look like. It's a general, uh, generally speaking, it's a steel building, um, you know, an A-frame gable roof steel building. It's about 100 by 250 in size, no windows. Um, we've got some, some man doors at various points for egress around the building and, and, and roll up doors as well. But we show, um, and I realize it's a little bit blurry in the presentation, but we show cameras um, all around the building um, as well as a secured fence all around the building uh, that really um, segregates us from the surroundings. Um, so on the interior of the building, as you can see, it's broken up into kind of quadrants. We've got four main flower rooms um, at each corner of the building, a main hallway. Um, at each end, we've got you know, vegetation space, support ancillary space, entry bathrooms, break rooms, locker rooms, security, loading areas, harvesting areas, mechanical spaces. Uh, but this is generally the layout of, of, of what our building would look like. So, uh, to fully discuss uh, odor mitigation, it starts in our mind with building envelope. Um, so that's kind of where we'll start when we move to the next slide. Mm -hmm. So our building envelope is, as I said, a prefabricated steel structure. Um, from an insulation standpoint, uh, the building's insulated to, to meet mass energy code. So we, we, we'd have to come check the building to make sure we meet mass energy code, which we, which we would. Uh, and from an odor mitigation standpoint, we utilize uh, a skin or a, a membrane on the inside of the insulation called Skyliner fabric that is kind of air, it's an air and vapor barrier. So that's our first line of defense in, in odor mitigation is to keep the building uh, tight you know, from an air infiltration standpoint. Um, excellent. Uh, as far as interior insulation, so the building structure itself is insulated. Um, and this is a photograph, or two photographs from a, a cultivation facility that we're currently uh, doing. Uh, so the building itself is insulated and aligned with the Skyliner fabric. And then inside of that, uh, what we have been doing, um, and it's proven to be a, a, a pretty effective way to, to build these grow spaces is we, we build the rooms out of four inch uh, insulated metal panels, much like a cold room panel. Um, so those are modular, um, they, you know, they're shipped in directly in place. 
And that's another layer of air infiltration and insulation. So they're kind of a, a room or a building within a building that, that, that is totally sealed from the outside. So from a building ventilation standpoint, uh, it's really broken down by function of room. So we've got our flower rooms, our vegetation rooms, our harvest and drying rooms, our hallways, um, storage spaces and common areas or support spaces as well. And I'll kind of go through how we, how we do that. So we, uh, on two rows in Massachusetts thus far and, and on this uh, cultivation project, we would use um, an HVAC system that is manufactured by a company called Quest Climate. Uh, we would use those units to, um, to ventilate really grow specific rooms. Their um, Quest systems in the industry are kind of regarded as the most technologically advanced system or one of at least in the market. Um, they, um, from a control standpoint, enable us to really, really closely control the temperature and humidity of the plants. Um, they're also pretty energy efficient. They do modulate up and down as needed. So they're not running at full tilt all the time. Um, so from an HVAC standpoint, we're, we're using this system, which in, in our view is tried and true because we've used it twice uh, recently in Massachusetts as well. So the system is a closed loop ducted system. The unit, the unit that you see in the photo would be located outside. There'd be one of these units per room. Uh, one or two per room, depending on size. Um, closed closed loop system, so it's ducted into the building, into each room, and then returned back to the unit, filtered at every at every point or at every interval. Uh, the unit brings in ten percent outside air uh, to to the space as well, which is filtered, uh, which ultimately means that uh, we would need to exhaust ten percent of our air as well. I'll get into that in a moment. So support spaces in the building that are not cannabis specific, like hallways, uh, building entryways, bathrooms, locker rooms, support spaces. Those, those spaces are, are able to be ventilated by traditional HVAC means, you know, using split units or VRF units, like regular Mitsubishi units. Um, so that's a little bit easier to discuss. So we've also generated a, 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 an odor control mitigation uh, flow chart to kind of make it easier to understand what we're talking about. Uh, so we've got our quest units on the left uh, of the page that, that supply and return air from the cultivation areas. Those units bring in outside air. There are uh, air scrubbers, two different types of air scrubbers in each cultivation area, one of which is called clean leaf units. The other ones are called uh, ProGuard DXM units. Those units filter and scrub air internally in the space. They don't duct anywhere. They're just standalone units um, that clean the air. Um, and from there, because we're bringing in 10% outside air, we need to also exhaust that same 10% uh, thereabout. Um, so that exhaust air goes through a series of carbon activated uh, filters and extraction fans, and they exhaust uh, to the exterior no less than 25 feet above the ground, which is a Pretty key point in mitigating uh, any any airflow uh, that would that would kind of fall back down to the ground. There are a lot of studies, and we have one uh, showing here that that are, are pretty clear that the higher up above the building that you can exhaust the uh, the effluent gas or air, the, the, the higher it'll stay. Um, you know, if you don't exhaust it high up enough, it tends to kind of come back down to the ground because of the way the wind uh, interacts with the building. So these are our clean leaf air scrubbers. These are located, uh, you know, unit, unitary units that are hung throughout the rooms that constantly scrub the air. They're sized appropriately, uh, you know, for each room. Um, and we've got those from uh, our vendor shown on a, on a plan as to how many there are. So that's one level of air scrubber. Uh, and we've got a secondary means of air scrubber, which is a HEPA filter essentially, uh, which is used in, in support spaces as, as well as cannabis spaces. And, and this is really just to, any smell that might get out of cultivation spaces into other areas of the building. This is another level of defense that deals with that before it leaves the building. And then we also have what's called a ProGuard Defender DXM, which are also used in cannabis specific areas. They're, they're wall-mounted unit, unitary 
uh, items that, again, scrub and clean and deodorize the air. Before I get into wastewater, uh, does the board have any questions about the odor mitigation? I had a quick question. You, you had said this um, Quest um, system was used in other cultivation facilities in Massachusetts. Yes, it is. Do you have any, any specifically that, um, that are in this area that you could use for sort of comparison? So we're, we've used them in, at a grow facility in Hanson, Massachusetts um, of, of sort of comparable size. Um, and we're, we're using them as well at a grow facility in Oxbridge, Massachusetts. And there are a number of other grows, not just in Massachusetts, but around the country that, that utilize the Quest systems. Perfect, thanks. Any other questions from the commission? Just to be clear, all of those, um, all of those systems that you've mentioned will be in use simultaneously. You'll have multiple systems within the grow rooms, the um, the harvest rooms, all that. Like it'll be it'll be mitigated within the room, and then also mitigated within the HVAC system um, to cut it all down, and then minimal amount of air that does have to be expelled, ten percent or so, is also going to be scrubbed on the way out. That's right. Yeah. As you, and as you said, all those systems operate um, simultaneously in conjunction with each other. Okay. So from a wastewater standpoint, um, we've got another flowchart that shows how we manage our water from you know intake of town water through drip, uh, through drip irrigation and um, out you know out to the septic system. So we uh, we would seek to tie into Norton's. Uh, municipal water system. Uh, once we've taken the water into the building, uh, we would put it through a series of irrigation tanks, which is where we treat it uh, with, fer with fertilizers, um, filter it, um, and put it into the plants in the form of drip irrigation. Uh, once we've drip irrigated, which creates not that much wastewater because drip irrigation is pretty efficient, uh, but once we, once we drip irrigate, we reclaim whatever is left into reclaim tanks. We uh, loop it back around once into, you know, into the initial irrigation tanks and, and refilter it, retreat it, use it again. Um, and once we've got uh, two rounds of water through the, through the plants, um, we, we reclaim it again into a tank through an RO filter. And then it's used for household uh, items, so to speak, like sinks, cleaning, uh, hoses, toilets before it goes out to the septic system. So this is really the most efficient way that we can possibly uh, utilize and, and minimize the waste, of, the waste of water that we use. Do you have any questions on that? Well, if not, thank Sorry. you. Sorry, I do have one. What would you expect the water usage for a growth size of that facility? Let's just say for a single cycle. I, we have that number. Um, that's more of a cultivator question, but I'll refer that to somebody on our teams. It's about, uh, as far as irrigation actual through the plants, it's about 3,600 gallons a day. It's, comp it's comparable to that of a car wash. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you, members of the board. Have a good night. Thank you, Zach. So just to touch on a couple of uh, things that Zach mentioned and some questions that members of the board had, a few referring back to the Quest system. Ma'am, to answer your question, you know, I have toured some facilities throughout Massachusetts and there are a lot of municipalities who do not require any odor mitigation. Um, however, I can say that the towns that Queensbridge has represented other clients or been present in, we have always faced uh, odor mitigation requirements. So um, I will say that Quest IQ 
they're a Canadian company and you know, Canada is the lead industry for cannabis. And it's kind of what we mimic, especially for here in Massachusetts with our specific climate. So when we uh, consult or speak with West Coast growers or cultivators, you know, they don't face the same challenging uh, climates like we do. The humidity is something that's really different when it comes to cultivation. So it's almost like agriculture in New England, you know, we base it kind of on our own practices. So coming up with the best um, uh, systems or practices, we've had to follow Canadian systems or folks that are in Colorado, so to speak. Uh, those are the entities or places that are comparable to our climates that we use. Um, because again, even in Massachusetts, it's still so very new where we really don't have many um, other companies to base it on. And the ones that I've toured at 85,000 square foot grow in Fitchburg, Massachusetts, they have zero odor mitigation. Um, and it was kind of mind boggling to me too. I was trying to learn and look for it and just, it's just not there yet. I will say um, that our botanists, our cultivator, along with our partnerships with the commercial growers and the laboratory, this is really a science um, aspect. So to so somebody that's myself who's analytical or just a common person, you know, we really don't um, understand that. They, they talk down to the micro biology, the, 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 the way that these scrubbers work. And Queensbridge has adopted what we would call the state of the art mitigation system that's about seven times more advanced than any system we've found um, thus far. With that being said, those are things that we've also, our uh, botanist is in the middle of patenting. Um, so these are some things that, you know, a lot of our procedures and policies and operational plans, they're, they're a little bit forward thinking as well. Um, when we talk about your wastewater, a great way to think about this is uh, when you flower a plant, you know, it doesn't just run out the bottom. So we only feed as much as that plant needs to absorb. So we answer the questions of what would we do with water waste? But when you talk to a scientist or a, um, you know, a botanist or a person who understands waste um, and mitigation and RO systems, realistically, it's very minimal. We've also looked into trays or base pans for our plants that literally there's no drip. Um, so that's how we intend to grow. However, being able to answer um, any challenging hurdles that come in front of us, God forbid there is waste where we suspect there isn't going to be any, we do have a system put in place. Um, even as far as that gray water, once it goes through that RO filter, um, it will be filtered one more time in, before it's let out into the septic. Because um, we, we have had to answer those questions too. Okay, so what about what's being flushed into the septic? Um, so we are willing to work with um, any entity in the town that we're willing, uh, that we have to, to make sure that um, we have the best practices, uh, which kind of gets us into your solid waste as well. So the CCC oversees all uh, waste removal from water, waste water, gray water, to solid waste disposals. Um, they've had trainings and contacts that you know we've had to um, encounter with just to, to get this knowledge. So it's kind of done like a commercial organic material. So marijuana waste, waste ground up and mixed with solid waste to render cannabis unusable. Um, these are CPP requirements. So they're mixed with materials such as food waste, uh, manure, soil, sand, kitty litter, coffee grounds. Um, then they may be sent to any solid waste facility in compliance with the Mass DEP regulations. Um, after that, there's a collection must be witnessed by two marijuana agents, which are employees of you know, our licensed establishment. Uh, we must keep records for at least three years of all of our solid waste disposal. <coughs> Agents witnessing management, uh, there also will be a signature with that. Um, so the type and quantity of material managed will be documented, date and time of collections. So the hauler that is collected unless self haul So haulers is much like um, ABC or any other local hauler that we can uh, contract with. It's the same practice once we've ran it through the required waste, solid waste system. Um, we also have to give the name, location, uh, and facility type that it's delivered to once it is removed from our facility. Um, so next I'm gonna talk about our cultivation, uh, manufacturing, thank you, as well as our transportation, our operation plans, which also talks a little bit about our compliance and our record keeping and our disposal as well. So Queensbridge has submitted comprehensive operational plans for licensures. 
and the cultivation, product manufacturing, as well as transport, they're all based on CCC regulations. So just like any other law, uh, municipality can be stricter, but not looser <coughs> than our state statute. So what we've done is we've kind of, you know, reverse engineered for um, each municipality that we are in. So right now we're in Norton, we've gone a couple of steps ahead to know that even if we make it through this phase or the board, you know, we still have planning zoning and what are those requirements gonna be? So we try to take those in account uh, beforehand and work the different variables that we might have in front of us. Um, our, our team has experts in cultivation manufacturing as well as product um, manufacturing. And we also seek out the best candidates to fill positions of need. And obviously we'd love to start with Norton residents. We also work with these partnerships for training programs. Um, we do understand that there's a huge need in Massachusetts thus far in the cannabis space for training. We've started working with staffing companies and um, just local uh, grassroots companies on thinking of innovative ways to bring in staff and, and train. You know, each facility, um, with, once it's up and fully operated, you're talking about maybe 100 to 120 staff fully operating and going within three to five years. So within that, you know, we have to think of conventional ways such as job fairs or internet booths. And um, so those are things that we're thinking about as well to staff our facility. Um, combined, we have over 100 years of highly professional security experience regarding hard and secure facilities and transportation of valuable assets. Um, a lot of our team, our background is law enforcement, you know, and the reason being is because it's a highly regulated industry. So folks who understand working under policy, procedure, state, um, under body cameras, uh, those of us who know how to keep things secure even when transporting them. Um, my background is law enforcement. And with that being said, it wasn't new to me when I read these um, statutes and, and how we needed to operate. You know, it's very similar to the policies and procedures that I've written in my past that I've had to follow and lead uh, membership or staff under. So we've also put together um, our team with extensive, extensive experience with working with policy and SOPs. Our chief operating officer has um, an extensive background in the military where this is what he does is write SOPs, policies, tracking, uh, something similar to the metric system, which we'll talk about and when we get into compliance as well. Could I just ask a quick question? Um, I was gonna, I was going to ask it earlier, and then I figured I would just wait to the end, but we seem to be peppering you with questions. The packet that we have shows somebody different as the chief operating officer. Correct. So um, since we have last met, this is where we stand. Um, I will submit supplemental resumes. However, Shane, we just had, it was a position move. You do have his resume and his background as yes. well. It was an organizational uh, move in-house. Okay. So I'm not crazy. No, no, you're not. All right, All right. thank you. You're on. Uh, uh, next, we talk about compliance again. Uh, compliance is one of our biggest in our leading uh, components of any entity of the cannabis space. Uh, remaining compliant, we have begun and will remain to develop SOPs or our standard operating procedures. We'll have quick reaction checklists that provide guidance and the tools necessary to run a safe and effective operation. Um, these regulatory tools will be mandatory for employees ensuring error and non-regulatory processes um, are mitigated. You know, so if there's an error, uh, it's something that's tracked immediately. The metric system, the CCC, our SOPs and regulations, they will, and our reporting requirements, they won't allow an error to go unnoticed. Um, uh, you know, that's the goal of compliance. Within that, we will have in-house prenuptial audits. Um, self-inspection tools to maintain in compliance with the CCC regulations and guidelines. These audits will be tailored to encompass town guidelines and ordinances as well. Um, you know, to come up with a solid operational plan, we can give you something that's concrete in compliance with the rules and regulations, but we look to work with the town in the next phase to come up with, you know, with the police chief, with the fire chief, to come up with what are the things that we, what requirements do we need to meet? which we have um, started conversations um, with the police chief of Norton. 
and it's, it's going really good. It's an open line where we can adjust and adapt um, what the needs are, and we hope to have more in-person meetings so that you know it, it's a fluid document and that it meets the requirements of learning. A QB will implement transparent reporting and incident reporting practices to ensure if there is a reportable incident, the CCC and the Town of Norton leadership uh, is, will be notified as soon as possible. Prioritizing transparency with the state and local government agencies is important to Queens Bridge's operational mission. Again, with our background being law enforcement, uh, integrity is one of the biggest things that you know we foster in any uh, company or anything that we touch. You know, we understand that. Um, it's a very new industry and we're talking about cannabis. We look to bring professionalism, the reporting requirements, uh, the security aspect, the training aspect to this, the things that you know are missing um, that would be required in any traditional business. Next, we talk about our tracking and prevention um, of diversion. So QB will use metric system, which is the Massachusetts approved and is the mandated seed to sale tracking program that will track cannabis plants from its infancy phase to its mature plants. The metric will also be used to track these plants through the packaging, storage, and transportation process to final sale. Uh, this will ensure all products are always accounted for, and if there are errors or diversion, QB can act swiftly to correct any issues. So Queensbridge has also identified other third-party uh, technology platforms to track sales and inventory um, in-house, creating uh, redundancy in the investigatory process for further mitigation errors or loss. Um, so there are programs that the CCC has, um, you know, if you go on their websites or if you reach out and make communication with them that they have um, given us to help with this prevention and help with the metric system. You have programs such as Cultivate. Uh, these are organizational just, um, software that help you organize and track. And if, if something goes, um, let's say, you say you have a plant that goes bad, that doesn't exist. You have to take pictures, the cameras turn on, the CCC has to see it, and you can't just throw away a, a plant. Um, and that goes all the way down from the seed process. The seeds are obtained within Massachusetts from a licensed seed bank as well. So there's also a process within the CCC that, um, you know, any seed that you plan to grow or cultivate is already tagged in that metric system. Um, all the way down to your transport vehicles, there are cameras. Um, the drivers, let's say for instance, uh, Queens Bridge operates with a delivery company. Those drivers would then have body cameras on. So these plants are literally under camera from seed to sale. We talk about allowing uh, your local municipality to come into the grow rooms when necessary. Um, you know, we'll get into that in the, the security piece of that down the line, but the CCC is always, um, there are always cameras on and live with the CCC. And they, they do have investigators, they're continuously hiring um, folks and expanding the CCC to meet the needs of the up and coming uh, cultivation sites. <clears throat> Um, so for our transportation, the CCC, uh, we will use approved vehicles only. We will submit um, uh, resources with every single piece of material that we plan to use. I believe we have given you guys some specs on Incus vehicles. Um, there are some, um, you know, proven vehicles for transportation in the cannabis space. Uh, we do plan to use Incus, and if I'm not mistaken, you guys do have a copy of it. If not, we will give you every single spec from those order mitigations to uh, transport security, anything that you'll need. Uh, these vehicles, they all will have forms of security and communication devices, so two-way radios. You'll have a logistics tracking software and GPS to monitor transportation routes. Again, these are all mandated by the CCC. We will have emergency plans in case of an accident or a criminal activity takes place, a robbery, so to speak. Um, there will be that software. Again, you talk about the metric um, and culture barrel. And they'll also track the products to sale. We'll have dispatch agents monitoring all transports in real time. So the difference between transport and delivery, again, I like to give the analogy of brakes versus Uber. So uh, we will be dealing with only B2B businesses with transport. So a transporter, we will solely be um, transporting product between licensee to licensee. There will be no consumer aspect of this. 
we could go between manufacturer and cultivator, from the manufacturer to the retailer, from a laboratory to the cultivator. Um, again, there's, there are only three licensed transporters in Massachusetts as it stands. We look to be the fourth um, one. And with transport, again, we, we look at it as almost like a hidden gem. Transport is the softest hit, quickest return. When you look at it from a fiscal standpoint, uh, we need vehicles, we need a gatehouse or a, a sally porch, so to speak, mm -hmm. and our plans, we need two drivers, two transporters, and a, and a manager, if I, you know, in layman's terms. So with transport, this is something that we look to, you know, uh, immediately pursue because it can generate and start creating revenues immediately during those build out phases. Um, with that, the transport vehicles, one of the questions that have come up in the past is where will we house them? Will there be space here? And those are the things that we do have to work out, um, you know, if given the opportunity in the next phase. With that being said, the CCC does require if we need to house our vehicles in a different location, it must be under the same municipality in which the license is held. So it will be in Norton. So we do understand that in that case, you know, it puts us in a different uh, financial obligation and or tax um, arena with the town, which we're fully obligated, uh, fully um, ready to uh, fulfill our obligations. Um, so the last thing I want to talk about before we do get into security is our hours of operation it's under the operations plan. So for our uh, cultivation, we are looking for 8 a.m. to 11 p.m., uh, but that is contingent on CCC and town approval. Uh, we do go by your zoning laws. However, the CCC and a lot of the zoning laws conflict. This is something that we're fluid and we understand, um, and you know we we will comply with whatever the uh, decision is. Um, and this is, we will have security 24 hours, 365 days per year, in person, on site, as well as remotely. Uh, our transportation as well would be eight to 11. One of the things that uh, the chief of police had brought up to us was there is an area where, although you know there isn't um, high speed, it may appear that way. So there are some of the things that we recognize that we won't necessarily need a, a detail officer, so to speak, but we do recognize that there will be places and times that we do need to work with the police department and the public um, on coming up with things to identify these areas. So um, let's say the residents say we're speeding and we're not because now we know we're gonna be bringing uh, the trucks in here to transport. There's something like we could put like a speed of visual board up. You know, these are all things that we'd look to foster open lines of communication uh, with you all, the board, the town, uh, if given that opportunity. So uh, the plans that we submitted for operations, um, they are as they stand. Um, and next, I'm going to give the floor to Dave Caruso, who is our uh, chief of security. Uh, real quick, Tiffany, before you do that, um, I think the one of the first slides that you were uh, had mentioned something about the uh, the cultivation, not the cultivation, the um, the manufacturing piece. Um, is there any aspect of the the plan to do any kind of cooking or is it just creating tinctures and gummies and stuff like that? Because the, I guess the the one thing that that wasn't touched upon on the odor mitigation before is ventilation of like ovens and stuff like that. And I, I don't know if there if there's any way to scrub that. Um, I personally don't mind the smell, but I think there's probably a lot of people that do. And even if it is, you know, coming out as smelling like special brownies. Um, <laughs> Absolutely. So in our manufacturing area, um, it's, it's really tricky. Uh, this is one of the speaking points that I meant to speak on. So I'm glad you brought it up. Um, when you talk about manufacturing, some people actually refer to it as laboratory or processing. So really there is a kitchen on one entity of it. And then on the other side of it, it's literally like a CO2 tank or actual processing laboratory, so to speak, not to be confused with testing. But yes, uh, Zach will, he can speak on the odor mitigation of that, but absolutely uh, there will be a smell and, and he'll answer that question for you, sir. So when you um, when you think of 
kitchen exhaust, um, you usually think of a restaurant um, like any restaurant, like Burger King shooting a cloud of burger dust into the air. Um, this isn't exactly that. This, while it would be a kitchen, uh, you know, commercial kitchen, it wouldn't have any grease producing cooking like a commercial kitchen would that would require, that would require a fume or a, a hood and exhaust out of the building. It would just be um, baking, you know, convection cooking and baking. So there'd be no direct exhaust from that. Any smell that's generated from that would be handled by the odor mitigation that we reviewed kind of in the same way that the, that the cultivation related smells would be, would be handled. So no direct exhaust from the kitchen, like a, like a commercial kitchen for any other restaurant where you've got the vent hanging off the side and it's just pumping all the air, the hot air out of the kitchen. It's no, it's not like that at all. Okay. This is, this would be more like your, your home kitchen where the oven vents back, in, back into the room. Yeah, that's correct. Okay. And then scrub before it leaves. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, any other questions that you'd like me to touch on before we go to security? Okay. Uh, this is Dave Caruso. Good evening, board members. My name is Dave Caruso. I am the uh, Chief of Security and the General Manager for Queensbridge. Um, cannabis and cultivation and manufacturing and transport establishment will uh, implement a comprehensive state-of-the-art security plan and use the state-of-the-art technology. Our intention tonight is to give you an overview of our security plan. We have met with Chief Clark uh, and we gave him uh, our, our security plan and uh, gave him a chance to uh, look at it and give it some review. Uh, he came back with some questions, which I think we satisfied, satisfactorily answered for him. Um, and our job is to, you know, to try to make it so that the town and everybody in the town is comfortable with us in our presence. Um, our plan, which is written in concert with the cannabis, the uh, cannabis control conditions, regulations, and of course, any recommendations that we can get from the town, uh, the police chief, fire chief, or for that matter, uh, the board members uh, in the selectmen. Um, a security plan will highlight CPTED, which means crime prevention through environmental design. Um, the design uses natural lighting, natural barriers, interior and exterior structures, uh, natural landscape, window and protective coverings, locks, clear signage for people to follow. The design helps eliminate blind spots and discourages criminal activity um, and, and, of course, diversion. Our building uh, will be fenced and alarmed to include panic buttons strategically placed throughout our facility. Um, we will be utilizing state-of-the-art 12 megapixel cameras strategically placed and connected to a CCTV, which we directly in accordance with uh, CCC regulations. Access controls will be placed inside uh, to include interlock entrances and exits, electric key fobs, um, di digital biometrics entry and, uh, and exits, and secured limited areas. Uh, access to all areas will be prefaced according to the job and description. Um, our security agents at Queensbridge will be hired in-house, preferably using retired police, correctional officers, military, and sheriffs. Our staff is, will be unarmed. Physically, physical security will be present 24 hours a day, 365 days per year, uh, with a minimum of two, possibly even three security staff per shift. We will train our security staff in crime prevention, awareness, emergency procedures, cameras, CCTVs, fire evacuations, and natural disasters. Our goal is to create and establish a close working relationship with the town of Norton Police Fire and the town select. So, which I meant to say this earlier at the beginning to qualify, um, my expertise and my, my background is I'm a retired warden from the Rhode Island Department of Corrections with 30 years of experience. Um, currently, uh, I am uh, state and federally uh, qualified as an expert witness uh, in jail, prison operations, as long as well as um, security. So that's what we got for security. And uh, I'll take any questions if anybody has any. Okay. Uh, general, just a general question. I, I'm not personally concerned, but ha has there been any indication from any other states that have opened up um, around the security, specifically around, you know, carjackings or robberies. Um, you know, obviously sitting on 
sitting on 9,600 pounds of, of weed a year. Uh, right. If someone stupid wanted to do something stupid, um, you know, they would know where it is. Uh, yeah. But has there, has there been any, I there, guess, instance? There has or, been minimal. There has been minimal. Um, and a lot of times it's, it's generally due to poor, uh, poor security plans, um, you know, coming in through the roof uh, in, in other ways. Uh, but generally speaking, it's, it's been because of that and there have been very few. Thank you. Um, sir, just to touch on that as well, I just wanted to let you know that one of the things that uh, Dave Caruso, when, when you asked that question, we talk about our background, both of us as training instructors, uh, we say that we're going to be planning for the biggest heist yet, right? So we want to cross train with Norton PD, we want to train with all of uh, or bring in those training entities that will need to be prepared for that. Um, I think that's a, a realistic expectation and or thing that we should always be prepared for very worst case scenario, right? What's going to happen um, when we talk about uh, there are vault requirements within these facilities to store, uh, even in the vehicles, uh, there are vaults. So there are no firearms with those transport offices, right? So we have to come up with different ways, what, you know, chase vehicles, alternate routes when they come and go from places. And these are all things that you know we can talk about um, in a in a better private setting, so to speak, so that we don't compromise our um, security. But absolutely, that's uh, an accurate. And, and as Dave said, we have watched reports and seen reports of folks coming in Rhode Island coming through the ceilings. They cut through the walls because of you know the type of structures that they have. They might be in like strip malls or something like that, where they share spaces with other folks. Um, the biggest thing that we, I've heard of thus far is when it comes to losing plants is honestly in the grow rooms, like climate issues, um, going through insurance companies that have done claims. I can tell you that I, I know a forensic accountant who was brought in as a third party from Massachusetts on a West Coast uh, insurance thing. And it was literally um, the climate went bad, the machine shut down. So they really haven't seen any theft, so to speak. Um, thus far uh, nationwide and those are studies i can tell you myself that you know as ceo of this company that i've, I've looked and taken into account of a lot of the the things that um just as a mass resident i want to know too from law enforcement i think about you know those are things like let's let's just plan for worst case scenario so we do look to work with the town on that lastly i'm going to bring on um sean creighton who is our marketing director. He is here with us on Zoom. Uh, Sean, if you could come on and maybe just give your uh, background and, and get us going with our uh, Roots Market. Is he on here? Sean, you there? <laughs> Sorry about that. Okay. I think I need to share uh, from my screen, Tiffany, correct? Um, I got you. If you want to talk through, I can, I'll, I'll just go from here. Oh, okay. What I noticed guys is I'm having a little bit of bandwidth, uh, trouble, uh, boardsman. So I'm going to, if you don't mind, I'm going to stop my video. I'm getting that, uh, low bandwidth message, but I will, uh, walk you through our go to market plan. So, but wanted to introduce myself. My name is Sean Creighton. While well, you see my face now, I am the, uh, marketing lead for Queensbridge. I'll be handling all of the, uh, marketing communications for the company. And that is the branding, the communications, uh, the, the uh, public relations, all the brand uh, messaging from a marketing and sales, sales standpoint. Um, I am the owner of Echelon Marketing based in New York, where I do a bunch of marketing for Pepsi and the uh, PepsiCo brands. And I'm also a uh, professor at Iona College in New Rochelle, New York. So uh, that said, I'm going to quickly just turn off the video. That way I don't bounce out and Tiffany, if you want to share. Okay, good. Glasses. So the plan guys is to walk you through uh, the six different sections that you see here in the agenda. Um, that'll sort of paint this comprehensive picture of how our brand messaging will lead us to what I call a, a path to purchase, right? Or, or a traditional sales funnel. Um, we'll walk you through our brand story where you'll learn about you know, how we see ourselves and the origin of the company and um, how that'll impact our public relations. Um, we'll talk about our brand's uh, guiding principles, if you will. 
uh, learn about you know what moves us and what's important to us as a company and as a brand. Um, we'll discuss our brand vision. You know, what are we trying to do in the cannabis industry? What are Queens Bridges goals and ambitions? Um, we have a manifesto to share, which is sort of like our credo or what I call words to live by. Um, and then our, our points of differentiation, what makes Queens Bridge different? You know, why will we succeed in this space? Points of differentiation. And then we'll, uh, we'll end on where, where I call the, the rubber meets the road. You know, what, what, what is actually our, our marketing and sales plan? So um, I'm not gonna read things word for word, but I do want to read the Q Queens Bridge brand story. Uh, word for word here, because um, I want you guys to kind of retain it and understand how the company started. So um, Queensbridge is a cannabis brand owned by a diverse group of business and public service professionals in the state of Massachusetts. Uh, Tiffany, who, who you guys have been building rapport with all night, an African-American woman, um, she started Queensbridge uh, with the goal of sort of bridging the gap, the, the gap and, and breaking down barriers uh, in the uh, cannabis industry, if you will. Um, also, you know, seeking to form this dream team, Tiffany partnered with a well-known area businessman out of Seacomp named Kyle Seba. Um, Kyle brings a, a wealth of energy and high-level business acumen to the company. Um, he's actually named um, number one realtor of the year by the Wall Street Journal in 2019. So very, very successful businessman in uh, Bristol County. Um, Tiffany also called on her longtime friend and, and uh, co-worker Shane Darcy to be the uh, COO and Chief Compliance Officer of, uh, of uh, Queensbridge. They've developed a 15-year working relationship as they both moved up the ranks in the, the Department of Corrections. Um, Shane's attention to detail and his experience with you know, operational policies and operational procedures, they really make him uh, indispensable to the company, right? Um, that team, you know, leads a diverse group of individuals with a broad and diverse group of skills and experience. Um, the company takes pride in being one of only four women majority, ma women minority majority, it's a lot of M's there, but women major minority majority owned cultivation establishments in the state. Um, they set their sights on building a sustainable business and it is important to them to reinvest in the communities where they do business. So. Ultimately though, they uh, aim to be one of the largest cannabis brands in the country. Um, Queensbridge guiding principles. These are really our core beliefs, guys. You know, it's how we wanna do business. Um, for us, it's actually bigger than just, you know, marketing buzzwords. These are really the values of the company. Um, you know, we believe our values should shine through in our marketing and, and all of our messaging and, and actually trickle down throughout the organization from sales to cultivation, the marketing, to security. So our marketing and sales be rooted in these principles. Um, we wanna focus on you know, high quality, high quality product, uh, innovation and consistency in the space. And that space is, uh, as we mentioned tonight, cultivation, manufacturing, security, transport, and eventually retail as well. Um, we wanna focus on and communicate a sense of efficiency. Um, you know, our leadership team in botany uh, and botanists bring a wealth of institutional learning to the uh, to the space here, and um, you know uh, high, we want to build out a, a, a state of the art uh, cultivation facility there in uh, in Norton. Um, our ethics, you know, we believe that a genuine, transparent we believe in genuine and transparent relationship building. So to sticking to your word is what we live by and want to you know, operate by, focusing on relationships and, and building customer service and serving the community well. And then also community impact. We wanna have authentic and genuine uh, community impact in Norton and Bristol County and uh, pave the way for what we call a newly envisioned corporate America. Next slide, uh, Tiff. Our brand vision, you know, we really want to be a lifestyle company, a lifestyle brand, if you will. And lifestyle brands are really brands that fit into a way of life, you know, recre recreationally or otherwise. Just think about motorcycle culture or cigar culture or, you know, sneaker culture or music culture. Believe it or not, there really is a, a cannabis culture, you know, within the, uh, you know, within the business. 
Um, we want to begin with cultivation, product manufacturing, and transport. Um, but ultimately, we want to build out into delivery and vending and other distribution uh, channels, if you will. Multiple consumer touch points is what I call them. Um, we're looking to not only focus on the flower, but have vertical expansion into other areas, uh, touching into everyday products such as healthcare, uh, skin care, edibles, et cetera, not just the flower, in other words. And we want to really build a company that extends the cannabis industry, sort of removing any of the street drug you know, uh, connotation or stigmas uh, that are associated with the business. And ultimately, we want to have multiple you know, locations throughout the East Coast and potentially the West Coast. So we, we do have span, uh, plans for national, uh, national presence, but we believe it can all begin you know, right here in Norton. We're not just a cut and run organization. Uh, we plan to have our headquarters there as we build out across the, uh, the country. Uh, the manifesto, um, uh, let me stop really quick. Any questions so far? I'm, 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 I'm kind of, I have a tendency to speak fast, but any questions from the, uh, from the board so far? Okay. Um, our manifesto, we like to call our credo or, or our words to live by. It really starts with the premise that, you know, we believe we can make a dis difference. You know, we're not just out to make money. You know, obviously we have to generate revenue, but um, we're not just about money. Our actual credo or manifesto is that the Queensbridge brand has a radical and transparent vision to redefine consumers' relationship with cannabis. African-American and female-led, QB has an altruistic plan to empower others, help create a better world, and to improve the lives of all its consumers. QB believes in inclusion, inclusion versus exclusion, and that's why we are uh, exceptional. Uh, so that really is the company mindset, and we feel that that will permeate throughout the organization, like I, uh, I mentioned earlier. Points of uh, differentiation, you know, what really sets us apart, you know, our unique selling point is what I, I really call it, you know, what makes us different, why will we succeed in the space. Um, first of all, we have these six core functions in the cannabis industry, and they're all, you know, in-house, right, a, a lot of companies uh, go out and um, outsource uh, sales staff or botany, you know, we have an in-house sales staff. Um, Ironically, most are from the liquor industry, which is also sort of a recreational product industry, industry if you will. Um, so that we believe that that is an advantage for Queensbridge. Um, we have a plant scientist in-house in with cannabis experience. You met him earlier. Um, we have marketing, you know, myself and my team, Fortune 500 experience. Um, great with new product launches and new brands. You know, we've done, we've done that extensively over the years. Uh, in-house legal. You met the security team and uh, in-house transport, but we believe that integrated team really gives us an advantage uh, in the state of Massachusetts. Um, we, we, we talked about being you know, vertically integrated with cultivation, product manufacturing and transport. All of that is under you know, one umbrella. Um, we aim to have multiple product lines, uh, plans for unique and exclusive uh, strains to acquire and retain customers and also provide uh, strains that are not currently uh, available uh, in, in Massachusetts. And we actually have the relationships to do this. So, um, and then from a knowledge and technology standpoint, you know, very, very strong uh, Massachusetts cannabis rules and regulations experience. Uh, Shane um, is a, you know, a really great compliance person. And obviously you've been talking to Tiffany all night, really, really know the industry. And then from a technology standpoint, um, you spoke to Zach, our, our facility will be uh, state of the art. So um, those are our points of differentiation. And then I like to call this next section is sort of like where the rubber meets the road, our path to purchase. Um, sometimes this is called a, 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 a traditional marketing or sales funnel. I, I outlined it today for you in a more of a path, a consumer journey or, or path to purchase. Um, normally, this has six stages, guys. So you usually have the awareness, which generates interest, which generates consideration among consumers. And then that leads to intent and that carries over to evaluation of your products and services. Um, we hope then 
you know, on to purchase, but a lot of companies stop at that purchase vertical, if you will. But our plan is to have a very, very strong uh, customer service and retention effort. And that's why you see uh, seven stages represented before you here today. It really all starts with a plan to generate, uh, you know, buzz about the company with local media, also with national media, and uh, certainly with the cannabis industry press. Um, we've already, our sales team has already reached out to over 100 retailers in the Massachusetts area. So those sales calls and emails have, have already started. Um, and we feel that that's a very, you know, uh, pivotal tactic to have in the awareness phase. Cannabis conventions, and then of course, a, a strong uh, social media effort, um, which will lead us to generating uh, interest. And those calls, we see those converting into actual in-person meetings with potential uh, customers or retailers in Massachusetts. Um, we've been developing sell sheets and uh, we've been de developing presentations on iPads just to give us a technologically, you know, a technological advantage and a sort of a, you know, a, a, a technological first, uh, uh, you know, mindset, if you will. We have, we're working on a uh, sizzle, a promotional vi a video that portrays our brand story to generate buzz and, and provide information to potential customers. Um, we're building out and creating uh, Queensbridge promotional items. And then we want to be a little bit disruptive, not so disruptive that we get ourselves in trouble, but we want to look at some iconic out of home media, you know, wrapping buildings or highway signs, you know, things in the area that will really be, you know, uh, have that wow factor for, for the company, if you will. And then of course, you know, local media, local cable, local radio, uh, local press. We're hoping that leads uh, you know, strongly into the consideration phase. Um, during that vertical, we'd be doing uh, within le legal limits, of course, but product trials at retail, um, creating. We think this is a really good idea here, but you know, we, ha we, we have a, uh, <clears throat> an influential and experienced botanist, and we like to create these meet the botanist events at the retail level, you know, bringing him around and you know meeting retailers and talking about product and so, some of the plans for the company, um, a strong grassroots effort, and then of course you know continued uh, public relations and we like to uh, integrate speaking at, um, engagements for our, our our leadership team Kyle Shane and uh, Tiffany. That would lead to an in, intent along this this uh, this path to purchase and. During the intent phase, we'd be presenting introductory offers. We'd be offering volume discounts potentially to retailers and then creating, you know, uh, different levels of retail promotions to sort of get them on the hook, if, if you will. Um, that usually leads to customers evaluating, you know, what you're offering and doing some research on, the, on their own. But during that, that phase, we, we see us, uh, our, our sales team doing those last minute sales calls and then true to the whole meet the botanist um, idea, we have a meet the owner meetings. You know, what better way to close business than to bring in, you know, Kyle and Tiffany and Shane to the big guns, so to speak, to uh, these meet the owner meetings at the retail level. Uh, um, we are expecting that to lead to purchase where people actually sign orders and then we deliver product with our unique and customized packaging. And then we spoke to uh, secure professional delivery a little bit earlier um, this evening. And like I said, normally most companies stop there, but you know, our sales funnel, I've added the uh, customer retention effort. You know, customer service is very, very important. So, you know, customer service follow-up. Um, we're looking into a CRM tool, customer retention management tool called Cultivera, popular within the industry. And that will help us sort of manage that relationship from seed to sale. And I have a little equation here that I'll read for you. It's that proactive approach equals repeat orders and referrals. And we believe that that is the way we will be successful uh, in Massachusetts doing our business. So those are the, uh, the seven stages. Then the last sheet here, I won't go through. It's really the bio and resume of our team. I'll, I'll save that for you guys for, you know, uh, recreational reading on your own. <laughs> um, if you have any questions, please feel free to ask them though.
Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Sean. Um, Tiffany, did you have anything else? Uh, am I unmuted? Sure. So lastly, I just wanted to touch base on what we consider like the community impact aspect of it. Uh, so what our company or what Queensbridge is set out to do is uh, we have submitted paperwork that we would like to work with the town because we do recognize that, for instance, a time like COVID, if we say who we want to commit or and or, um, you know, um, donate to for the year, I don't know if it works uh, at a certain time. So we do wanna keep that open and just be fluid and work with the board in the town and the community on what you all suggest that we should be um, contributing to. We are willing and um, looking to do as the max that we can do. We understand that bringing cannabis into any uh, municipality, what type of revenues that we generate. Um, our company is morally obligated to do right by the community that hosts us. Um, we do recognize that uh, if given the opportunity to move forward, we do have to do those traffic patterns. We understand that we will need to meet um, all codes required, as well as give back to the community. Um, we look to fund uh, the police department trainings, the fire department, whatever municipal needs are um, necessary or required to you know, help our business get where we need and or the things that the town needs. I think we would look to work closer with the community on an outreach program, whether it be to substance programs um, or, or whatever the case may be. Um, those are things, again, that we look for guidance from uh, you all. I don't have anything else. If, if there are any questions that you all have, um, anything that you know, we can um, discuss. So Next. Tiffany, I just had a couple questions. Can you um, forward that uh, presentation to, sure. yeah, to my email? Um, and also, can you um, update, maybe send us a new updated org chart? Because um, I think the other one, there were a few changes that, that seemed like happened since the last um, documentation you submitted. So it'd be kind of helpful to I like the org chart for the, the visual was really Absolutely. helpful. If, if um, I can, I'm not sure if, you know, what, what email address you guys would like me to send it to. Should I send them to directly to you, uh, Mike? I'm not sure. Yeah, you can send it to me um, or Renee and CC me if you want, um, and I'll forward them out. Absolutely. Perfect. Sure. All right. Anybody else on the commission have questions? Uh, we should probably just warn folks that we're going through like a really bad thunderstorm cell right now so yeah, here too <laughs> my lights have been flickering if the no. power goes out sorry <laughs> just apologizing in advance we have the same issue here too. okay good yeah this is a this is a crazy light show <laughs> yeah i i kind of want to turn the lights off and, and watch. i would i would just uh encourage you tiffany um I don't know that you have access to the, you know, the Facebook pages, um, you know, all the neighborhood chatter, uh, any new industry, any new development. Um, I feel like hot button topics that come up are always traffic, um, you know, speeding trucks, um, lights, uh, you know, so things to consider like obviously it's probably too early to have a, a, a plot plan of where you anticipate, you know, laying things out and what it's going to look like for, you know, where, you know, it's going to have to be fully lighted and, and understanding that for security purposes. Um, but it is adjacent to residential and uh, some people are less forgiving when it comes to, you know, changes in the neighborhood. Um, so that, that I would just keep that in mind and, you know, be prepared for, uh, for a lot of those questions uh, as you move through the process. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, thank you for that. Those are things that we will definitely keep in mind. Um, I do know that there are some light nuisances and mitigation programs. And um, within, uh, when I send you this presentation, within that zoning, we did look to keep it more on the industrial park side, where it's more of that wooded area closer to where you know, there already are the back end of, uh, you know, the facility there at South Washington. Um, 
So absolutely, those were, that is one of the things that um, we can foresee being not so much a problem, but something that we do need to address probably beforehand. So I do thank you for that. Any other questions or comments? Um, yeah, I'll, I'll go. I had raised, I had raised some of these concerns last week as well, and kind of similar to my comments last week in regards to Oasis. And I understand there are two different companies and two different business plans. I'm having some reservations stemming primarily from the fact that there's no individual in Queensbridge's C-suite that has any demonstrated prior experience in the marijuana industry in general, specifically no experience in commercial cultivation and manufacturing on a large scale, um, including in the legacy industry. Um, and there appear to be people without any relevant business experience who've been placed in executive level positions. Um, and that's a bit concerning to me. We know the first cultivation applicant that we enter into an HCA with is gonna be met with, as you can imagine, some very considerable scrutiny from both the public and the planning board uh, during the, the permitting process. Uh, because of this, I'd suggest an easier path could be navigated um, if Queensbridge had somebody on staff with firsthand knowledge mitigating the types of issues and concerns related to commercial cultivation and manufacturing. I understand that this is a relatively newly permitted industry in Massachusetts. I understand that there are limited in-state opportunities for gaining the type of practical experience that I'm looking for. However, we did see with the majority of the retail applicants that we reviewed they recognized that lack of practical experience as a weakness and brought with them corporate partners, consultants, lawyers, um, people they had on staff or were paid um, with vast experience in the marijuana industry and regulation to guide them. And those are the ones we chose to enter into HCAs with. Um, we had a uh, review process and not all of them um, got to the point of a negotiated HCA with the town. With the product being, with given that the product being produced um, and the highly regulated industry, I'd feel much more comfortable if Queensbridge had a member of its senior management or a partner or a paid consultant um, who was working with them who had commercial large scale grow and manufacturing experience. Um, at this point, I'm also would just like to raise the fact that I'm also a little concerned that we now have two companies and two business plans that have come before us that are different, but with overlapping, overlapping staff. Um, and on the manufacturing and culturing side, cultivation side, they're directly competing with one another. Um, so I'm very much struggling with the sensibility of this particular strategy. Um, that's, that's my two cents. Um, and I, you know, I, I'm trying very hard to, um, to find a way forward and I'm struggling with it. Sure. So a couple of points. Uh, so Massachusetts has recognized as a few disadvantaged areas where they do give these priority reviews and trainings, recognizing that, you know, it is a very hard entry, a Bowery level to come in. So unless you are a huge corporation with no experience in the East Coast or Massachusetts market, yes, you have production or overseeing of large staff numbers. So for experience in retail, it's not difficult to get someone with retail experience because if you run a liquor store, you can run a retail site. So when it comes down to picking consultants, I can tell you that the reason why our group has not committed to any of them is because there are no teams working like ours. There are no teams that have reverse engineered from the perspective of not just business, but rules and regulations. I haven't sat with a lawyer in Massachusetts that fully understood um, you know, what it would take past that. We have 
partnered with two licensed operating companies that are growing cultivation, uh, which is ProMeds that does work with our head cultivator for, um, you know, in the past, as well as uh, the laboratory. So I do recognize um, there is a very strong level of business on our team. My partner, Kyle Siebeth, runs a multi-million dollar uh, real estate entity as well as investment company as his nine businesses, a CBD company. Um, so this is somebody who does have that leadership and experience of running um, businesses, but you are ac accurate. When it comes to cannabis, it's very uncharted territories. So uh, when looking for that, we took the approach of putting together um, a team approach where um, we do on the legacy side have ton of mentors. I just don't know how we talk about it on in these town meetings. I don't know how you, I mean, other than the fact that you have a social equity applicant and to meet those requirements, a lot of those times it requires that you've operated in the legacy market. Um, so it's a really tough time to really talk about experience and or how your team may directly have that in the, within the parameters that, that we have other than being social equity. Um, as far as your staff goes, Queensbridge consults on over four uh, licensees in the process throughout Massachusetts. So when you see as a staff, it's an advisory board. The people who are investing in the market, which is real estate, uh, the construction companies, the actual financial institutions that are uh, lending, they work with my group. So it's really difficult um, to turn around and find support for us when we are really the only group that's in the market right now doing what we're doing. So yes, it's, it's you know, um, it's innovative, it's different, it's uncharted territories. And again, um, when it comes to business strategy, you know, your valuation of your company is looked at very differently depending on where you're at in this phase. Um, so as a female in a very male dominant industry, I can tell you that I have been approached since day one by big businesses, by big whales or shark investors. The reason why you see me standing here alone is because I need to hold on to uh, my company as long as I can and not get eaten or swollen uh, or swallowed by those folks here. Um, to say that we're going to operate or function or start without those subject matter experts, that's not realistic. You know, we do recognize that we need to um, partner with these folks. But again, we're 24 months out from where we need to be. Um, cannabis is upside down. They do not give you the traditional legs to stand on like in conventional business. For instance, you need an HCA before you can get an investor, right? Uh, before you can get a license. An investor doesn't want to give you finances before you have a license because in conventional business, it's just backwards. So for me, uh, you don't see me committed and I can show you paperwork for many options that I have had. But personally, I mean, at this point, I feel um, to disclose this, but you don't see me committing to those folks because I understand the value of what I have here. And I do recognize at some point to successfully succeed, you know, you do need to bring in that. But right now we're so far away. We're still in that concept phase. And in the concept phase, you pay an attorney who hires five paralegals to do the legwork that we're doing right now, saving us hundreds and thousands of dollars because I am, you know, uh, a grassroots company. Uh, we do have legal counsel. Our secure, chief of security is the person who wrote the security plans in Rhode Island before it even uh, took off on the ground. Your botanist that we have on our team is one of the first people to have a degree in cannabis and plant so so soil science. Um, our head cultivator does have um, experience at a commercial rate, uh, the company that he's mentoring. It's just like, again, it's really difficult to display those things, um, you know, in these settings. But I do recognize that. And I, I do lastly just want to stress that Queensbridge, what you see today, this is our nucleus company. By default, we have become consultants, so to speak. Um, we are equity in with four companies already, again, with five on the contract because, you know, nobody has a team. So we look to bring in folks to hire for those roles. Uh, Sean can tell you, he, as he's an advisor, these are conversations that we did have in the beginning. You know, you have to bring in folks. So in my position, I oversee a staff of 140 in a 75,000 square foot facility every day. Um, so I, I do recognize the, the weaknesses of it's great that, you know, growing 
is not going to be a hurdle of ours. It's getting the, that room to move, getting all the parts to connect. So I do recognize those as weaknesses. Um, I guess I just hadn't identified them at this point um, because you know it's it's such a ways to go. But we do have those variables um, recognized as well, so to speak. But I do appreciate uh, your input as well. Thank you. Thank you. It, if you don't mind, could we talk a little bit about? how we got to the point where we have two companies, two plans, but shared resources and staff. And so, what was the strategy there? Okay, so we don't, so originally we spoke with the town. Um, Janice can speak a little bit on this. Uh, when we first, I was introduced to Janice as somebody for consultant uh, work. And with that being said, there aren't many folks in this space starting these businesses. Our synergy linked, we match Janice as a realtor. So, you know, again, we missed the component on the last meeting where there was talks of lack of sales. Janice has been a realtor for 20 years. That's sales. I don't, I don't, you know, that's sales at its finest, but how we came together is cannabis is very real estate uh, driven. Uh, and with her background and with the information that we were given primarily that Norton was progressive and they were looking to work it was easier for us to be honest with you, uh, we need each other's resources. So where you say there's a uh, competition, again, we don't see any competition in the manufacturing cultivation space for the next five, three to five years. We could be, it's just like um, there's five factories in industrial zones, they're all side by each creating the same thing It's the distribution points um, change and things like that. Our business plan would need to to help that. But again, we serve as an advisory board, not as staff on for her, um, so to speak. How, also, as we were working through um, the different locations, some of them were not viable for the type of licenses that each of us um, were looking for. And we met each other in the financial space. So when you talk about the resources, um, pretty much Everybody who's in the running for cultivation manufacturing has shared resources. There aren't many people um, that are doing this. Uh, Zach's on his fourth grow as a general contractor in mass simultaneously. So when you talk about that experience, although he's a general contractor, he's hands-on with development of these businesses. Him and I have worked together on multiple different cannabis ventures um, in this space. So it's very much in its infancy phases here. Uh, with cultivation. Now retail, people, it's a faster hit, quickest return, and you don't need a team. You know, retail is the easiest thing to get up and running um, where you don't need. So when I started this, you know, a year and a half, we say in the basement, I called it out, you're in law school and your kids in college. So when you hire an attorney, they give you plans that say, we will comply. I'm sure you've seen them. So what we've done is try to actually engineer plans to help us become operational. And we did that through, um, you know, research through having mentors from the West Coast. Uh, also with this, it's really big business. The funds that you deal with, the, the where it comes from, it's not regulated. So when you're dealing with hard money lenders, you have to sign a thousand NDAs, a thousand non-competes. Um, it's a really, really a different, different um, ball game here, our strategy or, or industry, so to speak. It's, it's very, very uncharted, um, but we will not be oasis of tranquility's staff. We serve as advisory through the concept phase. So she has to hire. There's no way that 10 people can run that magnitude of a facility. Uh, we would look to go into uh, Canada using all these staffing platforms to bring in the best folks to run the facility. I, myself, Queensbridge, um, the staff that you see here, we will be operating. We will go to whatever trainings that we need to. Again, we've identified some companies, some licensees to work with us um, to help bring us to that. And it's just, it just doesn't exist. And we would have to, again, go with a big corporation. And that doesn't mean that I'm not going to do that. It just means today I haven't chosen um, a partner because financially at the stage where we're at in HCA and in licensure, um, I haven't had to do that thus far. Now, if there's different requirements and or, you know, things that I need to meet, then that's that's different. Um, but as a DBE, and I can so sort of speak for Janice, as a social equity applicant, we're strongly urged and strongly, strongly urged to, you know, hold your company and guide your company and do this. And that's why we took the certification courses and, you know, in hopes to build this. Um, 
can can I also add, Tiffany? This is Janice Israel. Thank you so much. I apologize. Um, I'm away, so I'm hoping that I have a good connection. But I just wanted to mention that I um, am a graduate of the second cohort of the Massachusetts uh, Cannabis Control Commission's program to uh, get people into the space to be ready and prepared to open these businesses. So Massachusetts has given me um, suitability clearance and given me the training to open, run, and facilitate facilitate this type of business and, and uh, agree with what Tiffany is saying. Of course, we will have to hire both individually, um, but myself as for Oasis of Tranquility, we will have to hire these roles. Um, but, you know, without an HCA, we're not at the point of needing to hire at this time, but there will have to be some. And also we do, like Tiffany mentioned, we do work with operators in the space that are already operating that we can have some type of mentorship program with, you know, there, there are things that are working, but it's just, again, hard to portray everything in the meetings. But yes, those things are underway and we plan to hire as well. Thank you. Um, Thank you very much. Laura, I did want to say there was a, uh, something that you mentioned as far as the business strategy with us being so close. The way that the, the regulations are written, our companies, there are certain licensures, for instance, transport that Janice needs to move her product, or I can sell to her at a wholesale rate for delivery where she can house, you know, so it, it does work, yet the infrastructure just isn't built yet. So it works right now. Uh, we've had some of the larger companies, Gardens Remedy. Uh, Janice was just accepted into a program. I, I know she has a, an NDA on it, but with the largest facilities in Massachusetts to help social equities, DBEs, um, you know, kind of get in this space or else there really is, it's not going to happen, you know, so that's just kind of where we stand. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate your frankness. I appreciate yours as well. Thank you. You know, it's, it's, you have to take in everything from every direction and, and really um, internalize it and take it in and make sure we can do our best. Thank you. I do appreciate that. Right. Any other questions, comments from members of the committee? All right. So Tiffany, I'll just let you know what we did um, after the last meeting is I sort of wrote up a summary um, of, of, you know, some of the comments that, that were made. Again, you know, so definitely, again, seeing the strengths in, in your security plan, your marketing plans, um, uh, you know, we included all that in the last um, write-up and certainly would include those comments as well or those, those um, notes as well in this write-up as well. Um, so that I did send off to Renee um, and then, you know, she had to meet with a few people to kind of to go forward from there. So really at that point, I think the EDC, um, and this is kind of new for us. So I, I, unless I'm, unless we, uh, something comes back to me that, that I, that I'm not aware of, I think once we send the, um, our comments and, and, um, you know, concerns and, and everything else forward, then it's really up to the uh, select board to um, the town manager and Renee who, who uh, negotiate the HCA to sort of get in touch and, and, and kind of move forward from there. Um, so, you know, we, we, we are part of the process, to hopefully to help you and to give you those that, that feedback and, and those comments, um, but really don't have a, a major role in terms of um, signing anything or deciding anything. So that kind of is moving forward. So I'll do the same thing after this meeting. I'll, I'll do a quick summary and write up for um, for, for Renee to push that forward and, and then you should hopefully hear from her and as to what the next steps would be from her end. Okay, um, just so that I understand. So from here, the EDC board doesn't give you, you do recommendations with an a, a approval or not. Um, and then does it like, you don't even know I mean? how we were notified whether it does that stop us from moving forward? Like, I don't understand the process. I've been I just, I'd like someone, if you could explain, you know, I get, we go over this, you'll give the notes, but does that mean that we're, uh, we can proceed to going forward to the board of selectmen or is it something that's shut down at this point? Like, how does that work from here? Yeah, I don't, I don't definitely don't see us as, as any kind of gate, gatekeeper. I think we, again, listen and, and, and hope, hopefully help you in, in, in um, moving forward and give again our, our uh, comments to the select board. But I, uh, at this point it would be with, between Renee, um, again, just because she's the, not not as her role in the EDC, but as her, as her role is on the select board and the one who negotiates the HCAs, she would reach out to you and and follow up and, and, and talk to you about next steps. I know okay. she did, you know, in the meantime, she talked to the planning director 
Um, she's, you know, had conversations with other people as well to uh, in between last meeting and this meeting. So I imagine she'll, she'll want to do some of that as well for, for Queensbridge um, and then reach out to you. So I would, I would contact her and let her know, or, I'll, you know, let her tell you what the next steps are going to be from her end. Sure. Uh, will the EDC, the notes that you do take or referrals, is that something that myself as a company can obtain so that, you know, obviously those are things that you guys see that should be strengthened. So are those things that, you know, if, if it's to prepare us for the next phase, will those be given to us so that we can, you know, put ourselves in a better situation moving forward? Yeah, absolutely. I think it literally what I did last time was just type up um, the comments that, that were made in this um, and, and, you know, during the meeting. I just summarized the comments that were made. So I don't think you'll you'll see anything on there that, that isn't wasn't said tonight. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you. Thank you everyone for coming in. Thank you guys Thank you. for your time. Good night. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Miraculously, I still have power. I was getting a little nervous there because I think if I lose it, the meeting is done, right? I yeah. did just say who's still here. So we still have Sharon, Mike. Okay. I think we only lost Cody. Okay. Oh, we did lose. Oh, I didn't even notice that. Yeah, yeah. Cody sent a text saying. Okay. All right. I don't know where Cody, what part of town is Cody in? Uh, he's over in the K's, I think. Uh, really? And I didn't lose power? What's that? Isn't and that near, near you? It's right around the corner. Yeah. yeah. So I don't know. All right. Hopefully you stay on. Okay. Um, so any other um, comments? Does that does that make sense? What I said. I and mean, hopefully you guys all agree with with. I didn't, I don't think I shared that with you as well. That after the last meeting, I did write up the summary, um, included you know some of the strengths and and, and the, the concerns that that Laura had mentioned, and I think Denise at the last meeting also. Um, I, I think it's going to be pretty similar for this one. Um, and I'll send those off to Renee. And then again, she can sort of go forward from there. Madam Chair, I have a question. Yeah, go ahead. Um, I just, for my understanding, and not, and I just want to make sure it's defined or, in, or we in the next couple of meetings find it. Renee's done an amazing job negotiating and taking the lead on this, um, negotiating the H HCAs and so forth. Um, the question I have really is, is this a select board role? Is this an EDC role? It's who, right? Because one of the things that, I, that worries me, right, is this group collectively has a, probably more knowledge on marijuana and cannabis than probably anyone else in town. Um, Renee, yourself, Lara, Denise, uh, everyone else on here, very, very has, a, has a high level. If we all just decide to give up, right? Are we dead in the pro Like, is there a definition of someone who's going to run with the ball later on down the road? Because I, I, from what I understand, it, that's not defined, and I just want to make sure that we're, you know, is is you know, as much as I would like to think we're all going to serve on these boards forever, we're not. Um, I just want to make sure it's a living process, and it may, I may have missed it in the setup of the organization, but is that defined? I assumed, and, and you know, others can correct me if, if I'm wrong, um, but I assumed that Renee was acting as her role on the select board when she was negotiating these. Okay. So, so, as well, as opposed to on the EDC. I mean, it is very fuzzy because she's on both, but. That's correct. And I, I think, as a matter of fact, I think um, our role in the EDC, particularly with, the, with these other manufacturing cultivation sites, was not originally, I think, uh, in the thought process, but because we do have the collective knowledge, I think it was bumped back out to here so we could kind of vet some of those questions that that we may have. But I think it would follow the same process that, you know, any other business would follow that need to go through that kind of process through select board planning, zoning that, if that, needed. Yeah, no, no, I, I, it isn't the process to me. So I guess what I'm asking is, so does is because I don't think the select board realizes right. Renee, we, we just look to Renee, right, as a whole, right. And I mean, I'm involved here, and I'm kind of on the watching, watching the whole process. But if Renee left the select board, is it a select board's responsibility to negotiate that? Because I don't think we, as a select board, realize that's a role that will need to be appointed if Renee decides not to run, or you know, or leaves the select board, or something like that. 
is that's I want to kind of bring this just to a bigger discussion is is that something that should be put into writing somewhere or a policy that the select board a select board representatives would negotiate working with the DDC to negotiate an HCA in the future or, or so forth Did, I guess or you guys can just tell me Michael don't worry about it right now I mean <laughs> I think I think they I think some I think you know, Mike units and if you, you know, select board person want to join it would still do it, but you, you've got counsel too to advise, right? If you're not obviously. sure about stuff, yeah. And the council no, definitely has expertise in this area and can tell you like the watch outs and um, things to be concerned about. Yeah. Well, I, I, I guess, think it, I'm sorry. And, it, and for me, I'm sorry, I guess I would want to, I wanted to define it because one of the things that I think, you know, a real sense of just being on the select board and, and being on this committee, this committee is doing its due diligence. This board is doing its due diligence regarding marijuana. And there's an information base here. If we just hunted that off to the town manager and not having a representative on a select board kind of helping that or working with the EDC, I think there'll be a lot of value lost. I, I really do. And I know that could change later on down the road, but there are stop gaps that this group is going to be handling this and vetting processes going forward. So. I don't know. I throw it to the group and I apologize, Laura, for cutting you off. No, that's okay. I So my thought was, correct me if I'm wrong, when I first joined, there was a seat on the EDC that was always meant for a select board member. Two, yes. Oh, there's two. Yeah, there's always been two, yeah. There's always been two, but I don't think, is it mandated? I don't think it's mandated. I think there's always been two, but I don't think so it's... I, I wasn't quite sure the process of how that came about. I don't necessarily, I, I think it's a great that. idea. Um, and I also think, um, you know, with regards to at least the going forward with regards to any of the marijuana industries, you know, that's probably going, should be the point person on the select board with regards to HCA negotiation, I'm happy to hear that there's two defined spots on the EDC for select board members because I also think it's probably a very good idea for there be to be two select board members um, knowledgeable and experienced in negotiating HCAs. And if, even if one is a primary and one is a backup, there's at least somebody who's got the experience um, there to negotiate the BHCA later on, you know, if one of them should resign or not run. Or well, I'm not sure if that is defined anywhere. And that's it's not. I, that I, don't happened yeah. to happen. I mean, I think it's, you know, it's a natural thing for select board members to um, be on the EDC. And I think the two was just because you couldn't have three, right? Because then you have a quorum. Yeah. So right. that's how it ended up more so than anything oh, written down. So she looks like she's on something all the time. Thank you. <laughs> Me? I swear to God, I'm stone cold sober. <laughs> uh, oh boy. I have a stash. I haven't gotten into it. I swear. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> But I mean, oh, well. if, if you think about it, even TIF agreements too, right? I think it's just easier if there's someone from the select board here to kind of bring that to the board right. to negotiate right. those, right? right. Yes. Right. Right. I mean, it's, I'm looking through, I'm trying to look through our bylaws. I don't think it's the fines that, oh, I'm trying to. I don't, rem I don't remember now, but it's a good question. I don't think you see us define anywhere in, in terms no. of anything. No. Right. No, but it's not, it but there is there is the, I don't know whether it's within the charter or the bylaw that basically states that, you know, every elected or not elected, every multiple member body has the right to develop its own policies and procedures. And maybe that's what we need. Right. Yeah. And, and I think that's important because I think it's a, um, I, for, for consistency's sake, right? I mean, the one thing that I, we were all founding members to get this thing back up and running and i would hate to see this this commission die again and this is one of those things that i don't think this should just be left up to well he does a great job and council gives us a great job of this i don't think it should be left up to i think there should be another voice within in negotiating an hca within there and i, I want to make sure that it's 
we know this is one of those things as we're transitioning in the last three years, we've changed the select board completely. So I just don't want to see that disappear. Like, oh, right, because last week came up that we had an appointment to the, uh, the GATRA committee. I, I personally didn't even know that that was an appointment from one, a select board representative. I'm the representative for the county, right? And unless we're keeping up to date with these things and the, and the select board is aware of them, I could see it getting very lost and just falls into a, a to-do list for the town manager when we say do this. And I think that's a, I don't think that's what our intent was when we started this process. So. Yeah, I think it's a good, it's a great point, Michael. I think um, you know, it maybe if you can bring that up with a select board and see what, what their take is on it. I mean, I think, Laura, are you, are you seeing as well um, that she's representing the select board versus the EDC? I guess if she was only on one of the boards, if she was only on the select board, would she still negotiate? Or if she was only on the EDC, would she still negotiate? I always thought it was more of a select board role, but. Yeah, I, I, it's I think tough it be because it's soon. new. Yeah, it, it's tough because it's new. We haven't entered into that many. And we went straight from passing the bylaw to negotiating HCAs and we were the body that developed the HCA with the help of, of town council. So, I, you know, it, I, mean, I, I could, you know, at the end of the day, the select board has to sign it and they have to be the one who signs off on it. In terms of the negotiation of it, I'm fairly agnostic as to whether that happens from a person sitting on the select board or a person sitting on the EDC. I mean, we could have complete turnover here too, right? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I just, um, so Denise, let me, let me ask you just, uh, just a, a simple question. Why do you think it should stay within the select board? Just give me understanding of, because, just to give me a, point, a different point of view. I see it as kind of a, I see the benefits of both. I just trying to see if it's where, where it really should be. Well, because I just because I think uh, the select board is typically involved in the negotiation of any contract with the town, right? HCAs being one type, TIFs, any of the union contracts, um, right? It's in, our, any, it's in our charter, right? It's in, it's in, our, it's in our charter, so yeah, it's in our yeah. bylaw, actually. Yeah. Um, well, you have to because you're legally binding the, the town, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, because all right, no, I, they have let me to bring, approve, right, Michael? So if it has to go back to the select board for approval, if it, to me, it seems like you should, that's why you have a select board member there. So it's not just the town manager presenting something to the select board cold and saying, here, this is what I think. You've at least had some input um, by the board, board that's gonna decide later on. Yeah, yeah no, it, and, I, and I agree. And I know when, when I bring up the subject to the select board, I know what's going to happen. Renee's going to say, look at me and say, yeah, of course. What, what, what do you mean? I mean, I didn't even think there was any other way, right? What are you talking about? <laughs> By the way, half of you are smiling, and that just shows you that I'm going to take that as agreement to that reaction. <laughs> um, so, but yeah, I, I will bring it up to the select board because I think it's an important thing that we just have for this board to, under, and this board to understand. So, just going forward and there's a, just an understanding that one way or the other, you know, it's either select board, it's EDC negotiating these things in, in the future uh, uh, and so forth. Right now I'm, I'm happy Renee and Renee's doing what she's doing. She's still doing a great job. It was not a critique of that. That's not what my role was by asking for. Um, I was thinking you're gonna put something in writing, Michael, that it would be something along the lines of the select board who, who negotiates it um, should, you know, ideally, ideally come to the meetings where we're discussing this and, and, you know, listen to the input of the EDC and take part in that discussion prior to. Yeah, I, don't, I don't think this diminishes the EDCs. Um, I think it's, I think the role we're playing, this is an important thing to try to, I mean, our goal as an EDC is to promote business, navigate the business within the town. I think sometimes it, it seems like we might be a speed bump, but I think what we're doing is preparing applicants um, or either retail or, or, or uh, cultivation or so forth to prepare them and put in the best scenario of for the, for the select board's decision. And, and I think that's one of our goals. I think 
ultimately that's our goals. And I, and I, I would always say that's why we're, we're, we're doing that. We're not, to your point, I think you said, Sandy, we're not going to stop, but we're not going to stop someone to go to the select board, but we're going to give our recommendation and we're going to also hopefully pair those individuals to shine the best light we can possibly do for a vote. So. Absolutely. Jimmy, I, did you have a question? Go ahead. Yeah, if I could add, I did ask this question uh, earlier on in the process, and I do know that COVID affected the way that your negotiations were handled in Norton specifically. I asked this question to Renee, and because of the way that the public meetings are being done, they came up with a subboard to do negotiations because of COVID and the public negotiation process, and because the Board of Selectmen can't um, negotiate in private without doing it. So that was the answer that I was given um, because I do know that in the other municipalities, it has been the board of selectmen that gives the vote because of the same reason you're going in contract with the state, uh, with, the, with the municipality, so to speak. But I, I did ask that and that was the answer that I was given. It was because of the way that um, the virtual meetings are and the bylaws of how you can negotiate something without the public being present and or in private, something along the lines of that. So let me, if I may, Madam Chair. Um, so in any kind of negotiations of contract, we have the right to go into executive session. If we think that that negotiation, any of them under protected under mass law, if we think that will hinder the negotiations of the contract. Um, and we can do this in legal matters, contract, um, employment issues, and so on and so forth. Um, and I'm speaking loosely of law and Anybody who knows open meeting law wants to slap me around because of my loose nature of the description, but that's the give a gist of it. Um, so I think in the beginning of the negotiations of NEHCA, I think it would start probably in executive session and then the public, the vote on the HCA itself always would need to be in public session. For sure, for sure. I, I understand, again, it was just something that I asked because I was, um, it was just about the process. And uh, Renee had explained to me why her um, and Mike Unitas were the people to negotiate with VA or, you know, it was just the explanation of the process um, is kind of where I got that from. It was- yeah. This is more probably of an internal question um, because we like I said, this process is new to us within the last year. We've written the bylaws. Um, the individuals on this spent a lot, on this committee spent a lot of time writing bylaws, really vetting it out and, and so forth. And this was one thing that was just kind of out there that I just wanted to get some understanding on and ensure that, that it's part of a, it's a very important part of the process. And I want to make sure that it's, that it continues, that it's really defined to kind of so for continued success. Sure, I know I appreciate the conversations. Is, um... Or as I guess, uh, just listening in it, it, again, it makes me ask the same questions. I'm not really sure what role is what, um, like who makes the decision. Uh, I don't know. I, I can't tell if it's a we move forward or not thing. So that's why I'm listening through and just really, but uh, Sandra explained earlier, so to speak, um, gave a really good explanation of what the role is or, but, you know, I, again, I, I just get a little conflicted. Yeah, well, we can can see we are as well, right? <laughs> but it's tricky and it's, I think it's new for us. Um, and again, I think, you know, we had talked about the last meeting, sort of the difference between when we were vetting um, retail establishments versus now, we had a very different role in the retail because we were trying to narrow it down. So there, I think we had a little bit more, more say. Um, but here, you know, we, it, it's, a, it's a tricky com commission because we certainly, as Michael said, we have, I think, the most experience in terms of the town and, and, and looking in, looking at these issues. Um, but in the end of the day, we don't, we're not the planning board, we're not the select board, we don't do, we don't actually sign off on anything. Um, and so, so yeah, I think we're, we're trying to figure it out as well. But for sure, Renee is the one that, that would be um, reaching out either on, you know, from the EDC and or from the select board because she has those dual roles. She'll definitely be um, reaching out to you and letting you know what the next steps would be from, the, from her perspective. Sure. Thank you. And I'll make sure I'll let her know that that's what I told you to. <laughs> so she's on the same page as me. Sure. I, it just, it's good to have a point of contact. Um, so I appreciate getting that. All right, anyone else um, have anything on this topic? Okay. All right, let me just look go back to the agenda. What's next on the agenda? Just 
on the agenda. Where is? All right, so um, business guide review. I just saw that you, you sent me some comments, Laura. I did, yes, sorry. And I know they're very last minute, but if it helps, I just pretty much said, yeah, what you did, I like that. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, I know that's what you appreciate, so. <laughs> Laura, if you I haven't known, I've made, made a career out of that. Oh, it looks great. <laughs> yeah. I raised two <laughs> questions. I raised two questions, to, just something to think about. But okay. other than that, minor. Okay. Tweets. All right. So yeah, I'll, I'll take a look at those, and and then hopefully I can send it off to my friend who can, um, for the next meeting, have something, a draft of something we can look at. All right. And then the, um, I don't know why the business survey is on here again. I guess it just probably held. Okay, it was kept over from last time. We don't have anything to discuss with business survey, right? Yeah, it was kept open last time because I think it was something that Mike was working on and he wasn't at the last meeting. Oh, I see. Yeah, Mike, yeah. Do you have anything? And, 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 and to be honest with you, like I said, I've said, we've kind of gone on, off, on, off. I've lost total direction of this. I haven't even, I, I think I, do we, I have to find the computer that that's even on. That's how long ago this has uh, this, this, uh, <laughs> gone back. Do you see this right it. now, Michael, for, for pushing anything forward or? Um, are we sort of on hold until we, there's a need? Well, I mean, it really, I mean, if you guys want to read it, I guess the one, the one thing that I guess that I never would, was very clear to me from day one is what are we trying to achieve? I've never got that as a clear definition of what we're trying to achieve by doing a survey. And is it, and who is it for? Is it for residents? Is it for businesses? Is it for who is it for? Right. So, so why don't we just table it until we have a greater need for it, right? It sounds like we don't really have. I think strong... there are. I think there are better things that I think our efforts go to go into right now. Like a business directory might be one, right? Yeah. So that's. I think that's. You know, I know that we're working on that. I think you know that, and that's our team project that, that might require more people to take it on, right? So. So I'll make sure I remove this from the next agenda then. Yeah, I think as you said, when there's a need. Um, you know, to follow up with something. Um, I think all of the business survey first came up pre-COVID, correct? Okay. So, yeah, so, I mean, you know, it's sort of changed a lot. Um, business survey, I think, goes all the way back to 2018. <laughs> yeah. Right? Yeah, it was one of the first things we talked about, right? Right, right. Yeah. And, I mean, it was, you know, I it kind of, it, what, how it died was the perception of what it should be, right? I mean, I definitely thought it was something. Other people thought it was another thing. It was like, okay, well, let's let's put that on the agenda to discuss, and just kind of got punted down the road. But to, to your point, Denise, I'm not sure what's is there is there a real dying need for it right now. I mean, the serpent survey was done, but it wasn't it wasn't this like, oh my god, great, this is awesome. This is it was kind of like, okay, you know. Yeah, I don't here. see it. I don't see a need to collect data to collect data unless we have a plan to do something with it, right? Agreed. Agreed. Yeah. All right, then the Norton Business Database is next. Um, Laura, where are we at with that? Did you get the information from Michael? Michael, did I did. Uh, hang on, I'm going to share my screen. Oh, he was like, well, how do I do code? She looked at Lucia and said, wow, Lucia's organized to the Michael spreadsheet. <laughs> I, I loved I liked the very the choice of the very very bold colors um with no I key my, I live my life in I live my life yeah. in color Laura. yes okay so carrying on from where we were last week I eliminated anything that was foreign anything that was a nonprofit, anything that was a trust or a condo association, that sort of thing. Um, and so I eliminated all of them. So we had 15, almost 1600 entries. Um, and then what I did was called out anywhere where we had um, duplicate entries. And in most cases where we had duplicates, I wound up keeping the Secretary of State report because it was the most detailed. 
and that's the one that's in pink, where I had, so where you see blue, um, for example, at the top here where it says Marjo, um, the only report that it showed up on is the town report. So that, kept, that was kept here. If it showed up as a Department of Revenue or a Secretary of State report, Department of Revenue um, or the Secretary of State took precedence over the Department of Revenue because the Department of Revenue report had basically nothing in it other than company name. Um, and you can see in a few instances, I'm going to scroll over here to the right. And, that, and, and to be honest with you, uh, Laura, I mean, if, if you're an equity owner and a company, that would probably show up in the Department of Revenue's report. So like my, you know, if I was owner of a, of a even if it was 1% 1, 1 of a company, it probably would show up in the Department of Revenue's report. Okay. So in instances where we had, let's say a town listing and a Secretary of State list out. Sandy lost power, but I can still see her. <laughs> I Are see. You, or is, is it frozen? Like, oh, she's like, I was like, wow, she looks very stoic. She's, she's just frozen. Oh, there I she yeah, is. frozen. <laughs> she's gone. How is this meeting still going? <laughs> uh, it, no, because it, 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 it doesn't just, the meeting just doesn't end. It, it defaults to, the question is, is I'm not sure if anyone has control. So that's the only no. Thing. I don't know what would happen if I hit stop share, so. Yo, if you, uh, that's an open control, so that's okay. that's not going to affect it. All right. I don't know whether to wait for her to come back. No, keep going. <laughs> All right. So yeah. where we where we had an instance where there was a town listing and a secretary of state listing, I combined them, and that's why you see, for example, um, this one here, Meadowbrook Lane Realty. So Secretary of State was the primary. She has no internet. <laughs> Hold on a Who has no internet? Oh, Sandy. She just okay. texted like, and said I was like, wow, the company has no internet? I mean, maybe that's the first thing we should do. Do we still have quorum? <laughs> oh, Meadowbrook Realty. <laughs> this, there's four of us. We still have quorum, right? Yes. She... Of what, eight? Okay. Um, all right, sorry, this is all very distracting. So where we had to, I combine, so I tried to, you know, basically call as much data from each report as I can. So where you see the blue here, um, I marked it specifically as Norton, um, uh, I forget what the title transaction type is. Basically, it was just the business registration and what day the town issued it, what day it expired, and what day it amends. Um, so I kept that. So we have, um, you know, as much data to go on. Michael's report that I added. So Michael had 55 instances where he had additional information. Um, when you say Michael, you're talking about Michael Tool. I always get Michael confused. Tool. Between, Sorry, okay. yes. Michael I, always Tool. Get I always get confused between Mike Tool and Mike Units. So Michael Tool, I took Michael Tool's report and where he had information. So you can see here, for example, Five Star Barbershop. Um, he had some information and I added columns, first and last name, if there was a uh, title of the person that we had the contact information for, website, email, and phone numbers. So you can see here, um, Five Star Barber showed up on the town report. Michael had some additional information. Where it got a little interesting is Michael had five, I want to say. Nope, more than that. So these are all companies that Michael had listed on his report that do not show up on a town report, the Secretary of State's report, or the Department of Revenue's report. Um, with the exception of this Gourmet Bay, that is there because we have a con conflict with the Secretary of State's report. Everybody else that is listed here has no registration with the state or the town. Um, and it may be that they are defunct, which is entirely possible. And Michael was using a um, 
pulled a report than the one that I pulled from either the secretaries of state or the town. Um, Minute so, Clinic is, is not, but it's part of CVS. It you is, pull, yeah. And I, it I, in. I did. I checked to see if it was CVS. I checked the address to see if it was under some, you know, a lot of cases it's under a trust name. There's nothing on any of these reports listed for 35 Main Street. So I don't think it's registered here reporting here. It's probably through the corporate. You're talking about gourmet catering? No, Minute Clinic there. Um, the gourmet bait, the this one, the gourmet bay catering does show up on the Secretary of State. It's still listed here because there was conflicting information between the Secretary of State and your listing and I just need to verify. I think it was just the address. I got to figure out which well, is the, my the, cor from, the correct address. I'm pretty sure your reports are newer than mine. Um, I was just working off a list from last year from Lucius um, okay. and I was doing this man very manually. So it was, I was, you know, standing from the TV, they're like, okay, let me just get, let me break up my list and start yeah. going to hit me internet and see who I can find for contacts and or websites, emails, those kinds of things. Yeah. So that's why it's like very this one, LulaRoe, I know is kind of one of those. Um, just like jogging yeah. pants. Yep. Yes. It's and it's the, I don't want to call it a pyramid, but yeah. Multi-level marketing. <laughs> Um, but by the way, when you, when you started saying, I don't want to call it a pyramid, you just called it a pyramid. <laughs> yeah. I don't want to call it a pyramid, but it, yeah, it's uh it's, it's Tupperware. It's Mary Kay. It's yeah, whatever. Know, it's, so, you know, whether or not she's required to register, I, I, I don't know. Some of these probably look like they should. There's a couple of construction companies. If, if there was, if they, if I got them from this list, well, we should get some from the list because she gets them because they pulled a business ticket. Okay. With the town. So yeah. everything that's on your list would have come from Boucher at one point? Oh, it all came from Boucher. Okay. I'm going to assume that these then are probably either they didn't renew or uh, refile their registration or they're defunct. Um, and we can kind of get a little bit more. Are, are you in, uh, talking about everyone that you're showing there right now? Yes. So, so remind me, Michael, maybe you know, I think we had this discussion last time, but they're not required to register at the town. So why would somebody register at the town? Is there anything to be gained from that? Yeah, it all really all depends on the zoning, right? If you're, you got a home, if, if you're in a res, if you, it's a home business and you're working out of your home office and you have people working for you that don't live in the house, you are still required to register your business. Gotcha. Right. So a lot of times that's what it that's why they register for the Lucia, right? So if they're working out of a home office that isn't zoned for business, they gotta register. All right. All right. Did we get Sandy back? Looks like that's I don't know whether she dialed in or not. So question to ask you, did you share this and I just hadn't seen this list yet or is no, any, I'm, any, I'm still working answer? on it because the intent is, so if you remember the last time, we didn't have the, this data in here, those yep. categories, those columns. What we also didn't have, and I'm, it's a work in progress, is, and I'm going to switch over to the second tab, um, I created main categories and subcategories. Um, and when I get it up and working, when you click on the main category, you should be able to choose from the distinct list of subcategories associated with that main category. Oh, Sandy's back. Um, but it's not, it's, it, it's Laura, got a, is, it easy, is it easier for you to do SIC codes? Is that gonna be easier? Uh, no. They, well, they, when the corporation, when the state secretary of state go by SIC codes? I didn't want to get into that. I, you know, I looked at the Department of Commerce codes and I've looked at the NAICS codes. Yeah. And they're more applicable on a larger, broader scale level. They're going to be broader than what we need them for. So I did, find, I took a subset of them um, and kind of combine them into some main categories and then came up with 
likely subcategory. So when construction contractors, you're going to have your engineers, your surveys, roofing, demolition, that sort of thing. Um, something that's kind of easy to plug in. Um, did the same thing with retail and then um, so we had services related to home business and auto, um, personal services, services related to um, yeah, your person or your pet. That's cool. Yeah, that's um, awesome. Professional services. So things that we're most likely to see, and I'm sure I'm missing a bunch, um, but I thought that if we could have a defined list then it would reduce the incidence of people just categorizing it willy-nilly if they've, they're forced to choose a main category and then a subcategory we're all using the same terminology and then if we wanted to filter or sort for a specific industry or category that's certainly easy enough i feel like i need a lesson in excel from you i didn't know you could do that on a separate tab and <laughs> use it for the drop downs yeah <laughs> Yeah, it's called a dependent drop down list. Um, huh. And my skills here are somewhat limited, which is why it's not entirely working right now. <laughs> but it will. Um, so we went from almost. Way, this 16... is what her and Joe talk about because he's just as mad. He's just as crazy spreadsheet guy as she is. <laughs> he's, he's, he's better at this than I am. So, um, so. We have, we're down to like 1100, which is still a really, really big number. Um, so my intent is once uh, I get it working where the, I'm gonna move the category over next to the category and the subcategory over next to the business name. Um, so everything will move to the right. I think the intent should be to kind of split it up and everybody take a okay. couple yep. hundred and go through and categorize them and figure out what we want to keep and what we don't. This, let me show you one really, there's probably a lot of these that we're going to have no need of keeping. Um, and Ruben is the one I'm thinking of in particular. So we have a situation where we have seven, um, at 308, 308 East Main Street, all with Reuben, but with different towns. And I have no idea what these are. Trust, these probably I mean, trusts. It's probably, it's probably a trust. It's probably yeah. a real estate trust company and they have different properties in each town. Yeah, there's a couple of yeah. those. There's a couple of other names, but I don't see you know, a need for us meeting these. Um, there's a couple on here that I know in particular are actually registered here, but aren't actually uh, located within Norton. Um, there's a Caribbean market on here that I think is in Taunton as opposed to Norton. It just happens to be registered here. So I think once we kind of figure out all of those the list will reduce down there's a ton of them here at the beginning you can see where it's just literally an address llc and i'm sure it's just a trust that's holding the the um the property so, so and let me, what let me, let me ask you this do you have a category like that where we don't get rid of them but we just kind of say trust that will basically almost basically in our list hopefully hide it later on Yes, so, so that is going to be in one of the, I will add that to the category. Um, right now, it's just, I think I'm using a miscellaneous. Um, I got to see if we can do like a free test. But I, I suspect a good number of these and maybe even as much as 25%, maybe even 30% are probably going to go away because they're just simply trusts. So, but it's in decent shape. I, I think I've gotten rid of most of the duplicates. There's a few with some, um, you know, where there was a difference in name, like here, for example, the all-purpose plumbing and heating versus all-purpose plumbing ink. It's the same address. Um, normally, I would have deleted one of them, but the business registration doesn't match up between the town and the state. With the Secretary of State because that's an incorporated, it's kind of incorporated there. And so yeah. That's so, you know, 
at the end of the day, do we really need both of them? No, it's just a matter of, you know, do we get rid of them? So another one where there was a question. Oh, here's one. Barnside Corporation has two different addresses. We just got to figure out which one is the correct address. Um, Secretary of State report is the more current report between the two, but they're not that far apart. Um, so just things like that. And I've just kind of made a little, I've made a column with a tick mark in it just to kind of go and take a look at them. Um, you know, here's another one, Breathe Easy Restoration Group versus Breathe Easy Restoration. Uh, one could just simply be a parent of the other. Kind of that sort they, of thing too. They, they also could be two corporations. Could be, I yeah. Name, right? it, they're just trying to do something, some, you know. Yeah, so it's in decent shape at this point. You know, I'm comfortable that we've got anybody that's got a business here in town, you know, I've, I've captured them somewhere. So I, we at least have a good working database. So once I fix the category thing, my intent will be to um, share it. And, you know, if one, I can just, I can either assign or we can volunteer um, and everybody takes a, a, a set and I can mark them with a, um, who's been assigned to which group. As soon as you're ready to assign me some, uh, I'll definitely uh, okay. whatever you want to assign. Okay. I was going to say, go ahead and assign it. If somebody, you know, can't get to there for some reason, they can just raise their hand and be like, I, you know, I've only done half of it. Can someone pick up the other half, whatever. Yeah. So I just got to fix the category tabs and move it over and then it'll be ready to go. Perfect. That's a lot of work. Thanks, Laura. Great. Yeah, You're welcome. Great. great, Laura. Thanks. Thank you. Now, right, I'll stop sharing. Laura, just a, sort of maybe, I don't know if this is a related topic or not, but that's not going to show, is that going to show like landlords of rental properties? Yeah. They probably have a separate entity, yeah. Right. right. I mean, it, if I own a property, I'm definitely could. putting in an LLC. Yeah, right. it could. Okay. Yeah. So, in terms of, you know, we we're talking about things like trusts. Yeah. It, it could just simply be the uh, business that somebody is running. Okay. Because it came up, I mean, you all got the email from, actually, Denise, maybe you didn't because. It, My town email is still having yeah. issues. <laughs> yeah. So we, we had, we got an, an email from someone just asking um, if there were, you know, what, what locations were available um, on 123, 140 for, for her business idea that she had. Um, and it, you know, it's Michael did a great job. I appreciate that. Michael drove driving up and down 123, 140 and just sort of making a list. Um, so that's great. I, you know, I, I I would love to do something more with that list, but it, because the other piece of that was missing from that is who are the contacts for each of those, right? That, that if we could have a nice list of um, all of the, you know, the, the, the contacts of where we can just say, if someone's looking for a, a retail space, okay, here's, you know, there's an opening here and this is the person that you, you know, you can contact for that. Um, would be make us a good resource for for new businesses trying to start trying to start up um, in town. Yeah, we might actually want to do once we get the spreadsheet put together. Um, maybe doing. I don't know. We're not going to have contact information for everybody. We're going to have to kind of build that in. But the you know we can simply survey them. But and build from there. Keeping it up to date is probably going to be a challenge. Well, once we get, if we get a good mask of emails, where we're we'll able to maybe kind of do surveying, just kind of please, you know, it's our annual survey, EDC's annual survey to them, send an email. Hopefully we'll get a certain number of responses to that and then just kind of go yeah. from there. Yeah. I'm do guessing you have any commercial space available you know, what's it good for? What's the square footage? What's the parking situation? Right at Bridget's, right? Bridget, at, I don't even know. It's so, it's so funny. I know a lot of landlords in town, but I don't even know the guy who owns the property that Bridget's is in. And mm -hmm. I know that uh, 
trusted business solutions. The, the owner passed away uh, last year. And it, it, it's like, that's for rent, but it's not even on an MLS listing. It's not on the business MLS listing. It's like, you know, I, I drove up, there's a big for rent sign. It's like so far set back that how would anyone know that that's rent? It's actually, a deep, it's a good size, decent space. Um, it's a shame that we can't get that far out there. You know, there's a place, there were a couple places up along the one from Boyer that I was really, really, I'm sorry, 123, that I was really surprised that would be great space, that would be good retail space. There's one in, uh, there's a spot open at um, across from Home Plate, from what I, I suspect is open. There's one spot that no one's in there, it's vacant. Um, it's right uh, next to the uh, psychologist and the cigar and the barber shop. Is uh, the vacuum company still in there? Vacuum repair place still in there? No, I think I think that's uh, the one that's gone. I think that I think you're right. Yeah, I think um, uh, I think he's the guy's name. I met the guy once. Uh, he fixed he fixed my Kirby. Um, uh, so, but uh, yeah, it was. Uh, but then there was some real plate. You know, there's a couple of places down the, um, the it's, that, it's that west side of town. Is that south or west? South side of town, I guess. Um, that were really, really good. I mean, I think there are two real big developments that the property need to be, uh, need the outside of the properties need to be look, look better. Um, but then there's that, what looks across from, um, what's it, Ed's place? What was it, uh, Sandy? What's the Uncle Ed's? Across from the Uncle Ed's? Oh, Fisherman Three and yeah, across from Fisherman Three, there's a it looks like an old hotel almost. If you look, there are properties behind it, but up front it looks like an old restaurant. Um, you know that 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 was there. That you know it was an interesting exercise for me to do, and it was I did. There wasn't as much open as I thought there was. Yeah, there's a it looks like a fairly abandoned building, and I, it looks. It's somewhere in between where the, I'm trying to remember if it's east or west of the gymnastics place. It's closer to the road um, and it's about half the size of the plaza that the um, Roma Pizza's in. Yep. But it's yep. similar it's, looking. I know exactly what you're talking about, yeah. yeah. And one of them, it's funny. And that's always been a that's always been empty as long as I've lived here. Yeah. Um, it's it's interesting. One of the things I found out is we had there's got to be two or three new barbers in town. I, I can't believe it. It's I mean there's all together. I think we have like six barbers in town. Yeah. Um, which right on right all on one twenty three. So, who knew? Yeah. One's a, one's a hub for barbers. Is the one next to Roma still operating? He's still his sign is gone, but he's still operating. It's still okay. uh, he's, he's still there. I wasn't um, sure whether he survived. Yep, there was right next to there's a new barber that just went into the office space next to the cap shop on 140, the truck cap shop. Um, oh, there's another one there? Just brand new, it looks like. Um, and then you've got boneheads oh. not far. We have boneheads, we've got toms, we've got I mean, it's, it's crazy. We've got uh, Danny's down at the other end. Um, so I, mean, there was, it's, I know I'm missing probably one or two. Who's the one that's got the sign out front that does firearms training? Tom's. Tom's. Okay. Yeah. You guys are, you guys are be aligned politically. What's that? So, you guys would be aligned politically. <laughs> Who would? <laughs> he and I? <laughs> look at the look at the look of horror. That's her face. <laughs> I'm gonna guess maybe not. No, I got nothing against guns though. But no, no, no one does. So, um, but uh, so yeah, no, I was surprised. But it would be interesting to see get get this done and then categorize them and see, you know, who's there. One of the things that I wanted to try to do is I want to try to stop in and see the Bit Whitney Bowes people and the um, Wayfair people. Just get a contact with them. Just, you know, welcome them. You know, I mean, I would love to see if anybody's up for it. I'd love to just kind of try to stop in and see if we can get a name or contact, even maybe step a time to meet someone who's running that facility for them. Obviously, I, I'm assuming it's a logistical facility or a sales office. Um, but 
it'll be great to know who to get contacts for those new buildings there. Um, and, you know, I mean, I, has this committee really reached out to New England Ice Cream? I know Mike has contact over at New England Ice Cream, but I don't think we really have a contact New England Ice Cream or Foreign Automotive. Those are big, those are big companies in our town. You know, Foreign Automotive, they, they have a huge warehouse in our town, and I, I don't think I've ever met them. I mean, I met way back when through family, um, but I haven't met them as the Northern residents. I don't think as a committee we've gone out to many of the businesses specifically tied to the EDC because we didn't we didn't a have a collective list right and know where to start and then you know what you know kind of discussing what we discussed with them all kind of yeah. keep the script similar right yeah and part of the, part of the these part of the reason I would I'd be doing it just to kind of introduce myself as a, as a select board member but. You know, I think as an EDC, what would be, you know, what would be a great end goal here is if all of a sudden we start promoting businesses through social media or so forth, or I think it was, maybe it was Lara that mentioned about thinking and liking businesses, and or Denise maybe mentioned it about combining, somehow finding synergies within our social media page and their same page to try to promote their business. Yeah, it'd be nice if we could actually turn this almost into a directory afterwards, right? Ideally. Yeah. Yeah, it's just got to be updated. Somebody's got to be, uh, you know, I view, you know, I don't know whether we are the owner of it or if it goes to Paul. I know Paul was the one who was initially um, kind of lamenting the fact that we didn't have one. So, you know, if he wants to take ownership of it or if we should, I, you know, us being kind of a transient member body, um, it might be better off if it resides with the, the director of planning. Well, yeah, yeah. And I'm not sure if these staff do that, right? I mean, Paul, yeah, Paul, right? I mean, Paul's got the planning board, he's got the ZBA, he's got the EDC, he's got, right? I mean, you, you name yeah. it, Paul's got it, right? I mean, you, you got to recognize, right? I mean, and it, the thing is, is he's, he's, He's got a great, he's, he's zealous for his job and it's, it's, it's awesome. But I, you got to also recognize he's got a staff, it's an administrative staff of one. Yeah. Right? So yeah. I, that, I, I would surrender, right? It's, it's uh, you know, it, my personal belief, and don't cringe when I say it, I believe this is a, something that should live within the, the clerk. <laughs> so, but it, it's, it's, <laughs> Because she doesn't have enough on her plate. <laughs> Let me say it again. Oh, let's see how, let's see if she shifts in her seat again. I think it should live with the clerk. <laughs> yeah, um, ide ideally, because they'd be the ones, yeah. right. you know, and, who'd be. Now, the problem is, is that not everybody's registering with the town. They may just be registering with the state. But, you know, if they need a permit, then they get on the report, you know, the Unfortunately, the, the data is coming from a few different places. Yeah. And, and there's and no I process. Think, I think one of the things that once we complete this directive, one of the things that we do is we can encourage people to do an opt in kind of encouragement, right? Sooner or later, you know, get out there, and make sure you're registering a business with the town clerk. There's no charge. It's just the kind of us, the directory that to help people find your business, right? It's, it's not a, yeah. it's not a big brother thing. It's a, let's help. Well, you. it's also, you know, if we've got, you know, uh, an announcement or we've got a, you know, emergency situation, we kind of need to know who we, we might need to get in contact with you. Yeah. This is a pandemic, for example. It makes you wonder, and I'm going to ask the question now that you say it. I'm wondering if most of these contacts, the fire department has most of these contacts. You broke up. I didn't hear that. What? If the fire, if the fire department, I'm going to check with Jay Robbins. I'm almost positive you, if they've got a business in town, if they've actually got a location in town. I'm wondering if the fire department has this information. That right. would be helpful. Yeah. So let me reach out to Jay and see if he's he has access to Deputy Chief Robbins. I'm sorry, Deputy Chief Robbins, and see if he has access to this information. Um, if he does, it's it should be part of the information app. So uh, we should be able yeah. to apply that. I can aggregate just, it if you can get it. 
Yeah, I, you know, something I just, it just dawned on me. I didn't even think about it until right this minute, but he's doing inspections. He has to do inspections of any business in town. Um, so I'm pretty sure and he has to map out the building. So yeah. he can actually probably help us with landlords as well. Yeah, that'd be great. Um, Michael, did, do, do these signs that you saw just as a sort of a starting point, I mean, if, if he, um, I mean, he may have that information anyway, but did they have contact numbers when they had a, a rental? I said, no, I like when they said available, you know, if, they, if, if you oh. saw a sign that said available, would there, was there a number to contact or no? Yeah, they all, they, well, not all, but, uh, the majority of them had numbers mm -hmm. and I can get you those numbers. I, you know, I, I took pictures. I just wanted to get you over that quickly. Yeah, no, that's yeah, just, Let me get you over the numbers. I should have just taken time and written down all the numbers and helped you that as well. So. Yeah, I think to at least have that would be would be helpful um, as a resource. Yeah. Maybe um, let me talk to Jay. Maybe Jay's willing to come on and just tell him what his role is regarding the business. Hmm. And that may be able to help us um, and see if Jay will come on and just kind of explain that and see what information he might have. That might be able to, we might be able to help and expand on what we're trying to do. Yeah, that'd be great. Yeah, he might have square footage, those kinds of things already, too. Oh, yeah. He's, yeah. Yeah, he's, he's, yeah. Got, he's got a ton of information. Yeah. All right, excellent. He's done, a, he's done amazing. Actually, he's, you know, they've done a great job with him coming on. He's done a great job of um, the permitting side, all, all the, you know, it, it was, um, on that end, he's done a great job uh, kind of getting it up to speed and up to date. So. Okay. All right, anyone have anything else on that? Nope. Okay. Um, next on the agenda was just a discussion of EDC role. I think that was just a carryover from last time. I don't think we needed to. Follow. Yeah, we kind of discussed it a little bit earlier anyway. That's yeah. what I put that other early discussion on there. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, and so then any, do we have any meeting minutes you had? I sent out three. Okay. Um, Andy, before you do that, can I just ask, can I just give some feedback? And I told you about it, um, regarding Cody's, um, I just, I had a couple of letters, a uh, couple of emails were concerning our involvement regarding open space or looking at, um, for closed space. And there was just some concerns, um, written to me regarding the, our, our discussion of open space and foreclosed space, and that um, there were concerns about people on from the residential side that were concerned that we were going to try to be focusing on developing residential property and so forth, and um, they were just very very concerned specifically near the Grove um, end of it. And uh, I explained to these individuals that we were doing this kind of we were doing this for the treasurer and so forth, but I just wanted to make it let everyone know that there were people that were concerned. They, they saw us looking at, because we, we had a lengthy discussion regarding some residential zone foreclosures and people were concerned about that. And I just wanted to also make sure we're focusing on the business side, probably zones, areas versus the residential. Yeah, I mean, it's a fair point. I think when, when Cody did all that work, he, he definitely outlined what zoning they are. And I think for sure that our focus is going to be on the ones that are zone industrial commercial um and the rest is more just information for the treasurer we certainly don't have any um you know we're not we're not trying to, to change anything over from one zone to another at this point we're just trying to utilize the properties we have in those in those zones that are that are good for economic development and then the rest more for informational purposes for the treasurer do we know if cody sat down with Catherine yet that's a great question. I think, yeah, this isn't even on the agenda, is it? No. Okay. To put it out, make sure we add it to the next. Okay. He did a great job with that report too. Yeah. And I know she's retiring soon, so we probably want to make sure he gets in there, sit down with her and clean it up, mm -hmm. hopefully before she leaves. Yeah, I would imagine she'll leave it in better shape than she found it. Right. I mean, and I, it also might be a nice transition for her as he just kind of gives an understanding as he transitions to whoever um, might may fill her position as well. 
All right, anything else before we go into minutes? Okay, Denise, I found 11, 18, 12, 16, and 6, 2. Are those the three? Those are the three. Because you had said you were hoping to get one or two more, but we don't, that was, that was just the three, right? Yep, I, right. I wasn't able to get to them. Nope, that's fine. Three is good. <laughs> <laughs> we can do three each time. We'll be there in no time, right? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so do you want to do them in bulk again? Is that okay with everybody? Sounds okay. good to me. All right, I will take a motion then to approve the minutes of November 18th, 2020, uh, December 16th, 2020, and June 2nd, 2021. So moved. Second. Excellent. All right, I'm going to do a roll call. Uh, Laura? Yes. Nice. Yes. Karen? Is that a yes? Yep. <laughs> Sorry. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Michael. Aye. And I'm also a yes. All right. Excellent. Minutes are approved. All right. Anybody have anything else? We're good. I will move to adjourn. Do I have a second? Second. Okay. All right. Um, go through roll call. Laura. Yes. Denise. Yes. Karen? Yes. Michael? Yes. I am also a yes. All right, everyone, thanks so much, and we'll see you next time. Bye. Thank Have you. Good night, Bye. everybody. Bye. Have a good night.